Hello again. Hello. It's Friday. Uh, it's time for more of this. Uh, part five. Part five of trying to write a WebAssembly interpreter in Ruby. Thank you once again <laughs> for joining me for this thing. Um, okay, yeah, so I'm, I'm trying to write a WebAssembly interpreter in Ruby. I'm trying to have fun, demystify WebAssembly for myself a bit, maybe for you as well. Share a bit about how I approach this. Um, I'm trying to have fun more than make something functional. I'm trying to make something that is correct, that, you know, that does the right thing more than something that's necessarily performant. I'm trying to write code that's clear and understandable, even if that means it's not particularly clever code. Um, I am still trying to just write it in pure Ruby with no dependencies. That's beginning to look increasingly um, like a bad idea, but we'll see what happens. Um, as always, brief retro. I've had a bit of time to think about how the last stream went. Um, here are my thoughts. So firstly, um, I made a silly mistake last time. Um, early on, sort of like an hour in, <laughs> um, I made an early attempt to use the evaluate helper to compute the expected value in an assertion, in an uh, um, assert return. And it wasn't working and I didn't understand why. And then many hours later, I went back and did essentially the same thing again and it did work. And I found that very mysterious and I didn't understand what was going on. So I went back and watched the footage and it was immediately obvious what the problem was, which is that I, I'd commented out the body of one of the instructions. I was talking about something that I wanted to do l later with the, I think it was the div, the signed division instructions. I, I was talking about having that with signed helper around it. And so I sort of did a little sketch of like, oh, if there was a helper called foo, I could wrap this in a block and stuff. And then I sort of undid all of that, but I left the existing code commented out. So the reason why my refactoring wasn't working is because the code was broken for an unrelated reason. That instruction was returning nil, that nil was percolating out through recursive evaluation and nothing worked right. So, you know, not very surprising that it wasn't working. Um, I think what that illustrates is that I need better debugging. Um, perhaps I need to print out the expression being evaluated when an assertion fails because right now I'm just sort of counting how many assertions have passed and then trying to find that assertion in the file. There's no reason why I couldn't print it out. And I think that probably would have drawn my attention immediately to the uh, to the div s instruction and then I would have instantly seen that it was commented out or I could have just done a git diff or I could have just scrolled down the file to see if anything weird was happening. I don't know. Like I said yesterday, something about streaming this live and being on camera is making my brain go wrong. Um, so I've, you know, I've made lots of silly, embarrassing mistakes. I'm probably going to continue to make silly, embarrassing mistakes. But I suppose this is just a reminder that I need to make my own luck and, you know, do things like improve the sort of I don't want to say observability, but improve my ability to understand what it is that the code I've written is doing so that I can, so that I can increase the chances that when I'm feeling a bit tired and I'm not really concentrating properly, um, I can instantly spot the problem without it requiring any kind of insight because that was, you know, in short supply on the last stream. Um, I mean, if nothing else, I should have checked that the failure that I was seeing was actually a result of the change I was making at the time. You know, I made a kind of half-hearted attempt to understand why is this change causing this failure? I don't understand. But if I'd just undone that, if I just backed out, I would have seen that the failure was still there. So it's it's not surprising that I couldn't see why that change would cause that failure because that change wasn't causing that failure. It was completely unrelated. Anyway, mystery solved at last. A reminder for me to just be more careful and 
as always, like check that the computer is turned on before phoning the helpline. And in, in that case, I got a bit flustered and I was a bit confused and I just didn't do the obvious thing. So you live and learn. Um, on the upside, um, after the mess of uh, the mess I'd made earlier in the week, I'm now feeling a lot better about how clear and tidy the code is looking at the moment. So that's good. Um, I've already, you know, there are already a few places where I've sacrificed performance in the, for the sake of like clarity or regularity, you know, for the sake of doing the same thing everywhere, even if it's not necessarily required. Um, and that's exactly the direction of trade-off I was hoping to make in this project. So that's fine. So this is just a good thing. I'm feeling, I'm feeling good about the fact that the, the code is tidier. It's cleaner. I feel less embarrassed about it. Um, yeah, so that's good. Um, this is maybe even, this is a bit of a meta comment, but I'm conscious that this is, that this is turning out to be pretty slow going. Um, you know, like this is stream number five. Effectively, it's taken me the first four of these streams just to get integers working, which is much longer than I thought it was going to take. Um, and that's not even considering how long, you know, one of those streams was just over four hours long. Um, so yeah, it's not, I'm not exactly racing through the WebAssembly specification here. Um, I mean, I'm fine with that. I'm enjoying it. Um, I'm aware it's not necessarily riveting content. Um, but then again, this is what it's like to write code is that <laughs> it just takes a long time and it's sometimes quite laborious. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I don't have a conclusion for this bit. I just wanted to acknowledge that it's going quite slowly. Of course, I hope that at least some of this work is front loaded. You know, I say it's taken me four streams just to get, um, just to get integers working. But of course the first one of those was just writing an S expression parser. So like, and, and now I've got more machinery to do with handling instructions. I've made a bunch of decisions about like where I am and am not going to use regular expressions and like where, what helpers I've, you know, what parts of the specification have become manifest as um, helper methods and things like that. So like, I feel like I've, I feel like I've done a lot of the setup work, I suppose is what I'm saying. And I'm hoping that <laughs> this might be famous last words, but I'm hoping that I might be able to pick up the pace now that I've ground through a lot of those kind of low level details uh, and that I might hit a bit more of a rhythm of actually like, you know, once I've got numbers of all kinds, then maybe that might be enough to be able to actually start building more interesting things. But of course I don't know. So we'll see, you know, I've got no idea whether I'm going to finish this project. Hi Mark. Thanks for showing up. Uh, I hope you find this interesting. Um, all right, okay, so yeah, it's slow, all right? I'm sorry it's slow. I'm doing my best. I'm not very clever. You don't have to be clever to be a computer programmer. You just have to be um, bloody-minded and persistent, and I definitely are those things. And also a bit pedantic, and I am definitely that, so we're all good. Um, I think... Thought, I mean, this is actually segueing into me writing some code now, right? This is the end of the retro, but this is my last retro point. I thought about floats a bit because I spent a bit of time at the end of the last stream talking about floats. I mean, uh, to be honest, I spent quite a long time fretting about how Ruby's floats were probably not going to be good enough because they don't have payloads for not a number values and they don't have negative NANs and stuff. Um, another problem I thought of since then is that Ruby floats are double precision. So they're 64-bit floats, I think. Um, and I don't know of any way to use single single precision floats, 32-bit floats in Ruby. Um, but WebAssembly does have 32-bit floats. So that seems like it will almost certainly be a problem, that sort of impedance mismatch. Hi, Chris. Thanks for coming. Thanks for coming back, I should say. Always glad to have some have a returning customer. Um, yeah, hopefully uh, the floats will be interesting for you. Um, so yeah, I've added a worry to my mental pile of worries, which is that, oh, in addition to things like negative NANs and NAN payloads and like esoterica like that, I think there's the larger problem of 16-bit floats, which necessarily have different 
sorry, 32 bit floats. See, I'm already, I've, that's my first completely mindless error of the stream. Um, single precision floats, you know, they have subtly different behavior, you know, they are clearly less precise. And it feels to me like this is the kind of thing that we're gonna, I'd be amazed if we managed to get through implementing all of the floats without that causing friction. You know, the fact that we're gonna have to use double precision floats for everything if we use Ruby floats, I'm anticipating more pain there. However, on the upside, after all of that yammering on about floats last time and worrying about them, it made me realize that all my concerns about, oh, uh, Ruby floats don't represent, don't allow you to represent blah. You know, they don't allow you to put a payload into a not a number value. They don't allow you to represent a negative, not a number. And I suppose also the point I'm making about um, 32 versus 64 bit floats, um, I could, I could quite easily mitigate all of those by just instead of trying, instead of doing what I did with integers, which is rep, na the naive representation, you know, represent WebAssembly integers with Ruby integers because Ruby integers are just arbitrary precision anyway. So you can put, you can have as large a, a Ruby integer as you like. Um, rather than doing the float equivalent of that, represent WebAssembly floats with Ruby floats. I could represent WebAssembly floats with Ruby integers. So represent them as their bit pattern stored as an integer. And if I do that, if that's how, in the same way as we're sort of normalizing all of the representations of integers into an unsigned representation, and then I've got those helpers that can convert them to and from signed numbers for the instructions that need them to be signed numbers, I can just pull the same trick with floats. I can represent them as integers that contain the right bit pattern. Um, and then I can manipulate that bit pattern. So if I just want to flip the sign bit, or if I want to set the exponent or the fraction to some particular value, I can do that by just twiddling the bits of that integer. Um, and that gives me complete control over what is stored in the canonical representation of the float, because it's just an integer that I control. And then I can still convert that into a Ruby float to, to actually do floating point arithmetic on it. So if I have, oh yeah, okay. I was gonna say I haven't thought this through, but I've just, you know, I can use pack and unpack. It's the thought I just had. If I can just convert back and forth between those two representations, then it doesn't matter that Ruby doesn't allow me to, for example, mark a not a number value as being negative or put a payload in it because I'm not gonna be asking Ruby to store that kind of thing. I can be storing that in my representation. So that's the good news, is that I think that is eminently doable. Um, so I'm going to eminently do it. I'm going to try to do it this time. Um, all right. So let's uh, let's get stuck in. Uh, I'll, I'll start writing some code. Um, where did I get to last time? Uh, basically everything... Oh yeah, uh, well, I've long since been at the point where everything is working. Um, I'm gonna keep, cause I've been putting off floats for so long, even though it would only take me five seconds to make a Ruby version file and write a little Ruby or bash script to run the tests. I am gonna, I've promised that I'm gonna look at floats. And so I'm gonna start doing that now. So this was, I've added this to my to-do list. Try representing 32 bit and 64 bit floats as 32 bit and 64 bit integers. That's my, that's my idea. Um, and so let's take a look at, I'm gonna make a new browser here. Um, let's look at the tests first. Um, so I think the one I was looking at last time was float literals. Yeah. So this is what I'm going to try and do. Uh, yeah, sort of, I know it seems like I'm unnecessarily fixated on NAN values, but I I'm not really. It's just that that's the first, <laughs> this, this, acceptance test is fixated on NAN values. So that's not my fault. That's why I'm so worried about them. Um, but this is the test we've got to make pass. Um, so this is going to be, part of the challenge is going to be parsing these strings into floats. Uh, and part of the challenge is going to be, um, once we've parsed them, making sure that we've got the correct, we've got the 
it's their bit for bit identical in their integer representation or in their in their sort of bit field representation to what this test expects because this is obviously important now something i just asserted although although i presented evidence by trying stuff out in irb i just asserted last time that uh, WebAssembly uses IEEE 754 floats. 764? 754? I can never, I can never remember this. I've, I can remember all the details of the spec apart from the arbitrary integer that they use. It's 754, isn't it? Um, yes. Um, in fact, let's, let's look at the WebAssembly spec. Um, where is the semantics live? I think it's probably in here. Numerics. Math jacks. Math jacks. Uh, representations, integers, floating point. Ah, yes. Okay. Well, I could have just, I could have just gone straight to this page, couldn't I? Um, floating point values are represented in the respective binary format defined by IEEE 754, I guess 2019 edition. Um, and then this, right, okay. I mean, I did talk about this yesterday and I sort of went through the details of how, well, I skimmed over the details of how this works because I was not sure whether we were gonna have to get into it. But if I go with my plan to represent floats as uh, sort of bit fields uh, in an integer, then we definitely are gonna have to understand this. But, right, I mean, this is, if you had to reverse engineer the encoding scheme of floating point numbers from only this, I think it would be quite challenging. I, I, I recognize all of these pieces because I know how <laughs> IEEE floats uh, are encoded, but the I talked about it a little bit last time. Um, I mean, this test starts with, these are all single precision 32-bit and 32 bits are sort of nice and easy to read, so. I'll probably focus on 32 bits, but the, yeah, the long and the short of it is that these, so these are 32 bits broken up into one sign bit, eight exponent bits, and then 23, I'm gonna call them fraction bits. Some people call these the significant, but it's a little bit ambiguous what that means, or at least to me, it feels ambiguous. So I'd rather, I'd rather say it's this 23 bits, um, you know, 24 bit significant. Uh, making a um, single precision 32-bit and then double precision 64-bit is one sign bit plus 11 exponent bits plus <laughs> 64 minus 1 minus 11 52 fraction bits making a 53-bit significant right so what, so, so this thing here, this is, let me see if I can sort of do an ASCII. Um, <laughs> oh, good, Mark. I'm glad that I can be doing a sort of, you know, computer science ASMR for you while you're packing to move house. So yeah, just let my, let my boring voice just lull you into a, into a calm kind of mindset. That's, that's all I can ask for. So this is the sign. Um, zero means positive, one means negative. Um, this is the exponent, and then this is the fraction. Uh, and essentially what this thing here is telling us somewhat um, obliquely is that, you know, I've, I've explained that into 32 bits you can pack these different sections, these three different um, chunks of bits can all be packed together into a 32-bit value. I haven't explained what they mean. Well, I've exp I just explained what the sign bit means. Um, the way this works is, yeah, the sign is whether it's positive or negative. The fraction is interpreted as, well, in the in the general case, the fraction is interpreted as a binary number that you write after the decimal point. So let's imagine this is uh, one zero one zero one zero one zero, and then all the rest of them are zeros, right? Just to so I don't spend all day 
um, writing these in. So this fraction means that we're starting out with the binary number one point one dot this. So there's that's why I've said that there's a. Uh, okay, Chris is asking how much in the spec will I have to implement? There are rules around equality and rounding that might be a lot to do. Um, so that's a good question. I don't know yet. I don't know yet. I mean, what the reason I'm talking about this right now, and I haven't even started to write any code yet, is because, I mean, I, I'm preempting something that I haven't, I'm preempting a problem I haven't hit yet. But I think we're going to need to understand this in coding in order for me to be able to do the... Um, like I said, um, flipping the sign bit on a not a number value, right? So I'm going to need to know a little bit about where this information is stored. Um, for things like equality and rounding, I'm not sure. Um, it depends on how much we can lean on Ruby, I think is the answer. If we can, best case scenario, if I can store my floats in this sort of canonical representation that is a string of bits and then every time the WebAssembly spec says here's an operation on floats you know comparing for equality or dividing or multiplying or added, adding or anything like that or truncating um, rounding um, if I can just turn it into a Ruby float do that op find a method in the float class that does exactly that thing call it and then encode the result back into an integer and then the acceptance test says you're good then I'll be very happy. Like, that's what I hope I can do. So I'm not intending to actually implement any operations on this representation. I'm just expecting that I'm going to need to twiddle the bits in it to achieve the ability to parse these floats that Ruby doesn't have the ability to parse. You know, I can't parse minus nan into a Ruby float because that's not a thing. So I'm. I hope the answer is I'm not going to have to do it. I'm not going to have to implement that stuff, but I suppose we'll find out. So what I was saying was there's there's an implicit one dot, which is why the significand is, when I said here, making a 24-bit significand, is because there's an implicit one dot, and then this fraction, and well, the reason why I like calling it the fraction is because it reminds me that it appears after a decimal point. And I mean this, um, again, if you're not, uh, if you haven't, if you haven't been exposed to this before, then it might not be very clear what this means. But of course, this is, you know, this is binary. It's just analogous to like if we do, you know, 3.141592654. In decimal, that means um, three, th three ones. So it's three times, sorry, three times one plus... And then, in, in, you know, if we go, we'll go to the left, the columns increase by powers of 10, right? So it's the tens and then the hundreds and then the thousands and then so on. If we go in the opposite direction, we go down by powers of 10. So this is 3 times 1 plus 1 times 0.1 plus 4 times 0.01 plus, uh, I've already lost track, 1 times 0.001. And obviously these numbers here are actually powers of 10. So this one here is actually 10 to the zero. This 0 0.1 is 10 to the minus one. Uh, this is 10 to the minus two. This is 10 to the minus three. So this is, I'm just recapping primary school here, right? This is how, this is how decimal numbers after the digits after the decimal point work in base 10. And exactly the same thing applies here. So when I say we write the fraction as a, uh, binary at decimal number, that means you read this as one times two to the power of zero, because we're in base two, not base not, not, not base ten, plus one times two to the power of minus one, plus zero times two to the power of minus two, plus one times two to the power of minus three, and so on. So this is exactly the same scheme of what does it mean to write a number with a decimal point in it, but it's just in a different radix, in a different base. Um, so nothing particularly special there. This is may, this might be GCSE maths rather than primary school maths, but it's not. There's nothing mind blowing here. It's just write. How do you write decimal numbers in a different base? So that's what the fraction means. And then the exponent. I I'm not gonna 
fully talk about what this is because it's encoded in a specific way. But the, it is an encoded value that tells you what this is times two to the power of what. So the idea is you can write any number, it doesn't have to be a whole number, you know, a fractional number as a combination of this kind of 24 digit decimal, decimals are bad word but this this kind of this format of binary number that's one dot and then 23 more binary digits times two to the power of something and the reason i'm saying that this has got a specific encoding is because this can be a positive or a negative number so this could be if you want to represent a very small number this could be two to the power of minus 100 or if you wanted to represent a very large number it could be two to the power of plus 100 in fact it sort of goes up this is because this is eight bits for a single precision flow, it goes up to about 127 and down to about minus 127. Um, and there's just, if, if we actually need to decode this, I'll spend some time talking about how this exponent is represented in that bit pattern. But it's, it's just, there's just an arbitrary choice of like, how do we represent positive and negative numbers here? Do we have a, just have a sign bit? Do we use two's complement? In fact, it's a different scheme again, but um, it's not important for our purposes. We just know that this is where the exponent lives. Um, so that's it. Like, that's how this works is that like, this is just writing down what's the, what's the part after the one dot, what do we multiply it by two to the power of, and is it positive or negative? So that's, as long as we know the layout of these bits, that will give us everything we need to be able to manipulate the representation of a floating point number as a, as an array of bits, um, and hopefully achieve what we want. So I'm, I'm sort of going off on one here. Um, let's just have a look at this. I'm going to try, I've got to come up with some kind of mnemonic so that I can actually remember this number because for some reason I always, I always want to say 764. Um, um, I don't know why I'm looking at this. I thought there might be a diagram or something that would illuminate. Oh yeah. Okay. There is a diagram. All right. This is exactly what I was just talking about. Okay, sine exponent fraction. Okay, so, do, you know, you don't need all this stuff I wrote down here. There's a nice picture of it here. Um, again, they've chosen 32 bits um, and they've given an actual concrete example. Clearly here, 0 0.15625 is, zero, is 1.01 .01 in binary times two to the power of whatever uh, exponent this represents. And it's positive because the sign bit is zero. Okay, I think I've made my point. Um, no pun intended. Uh, let's start trying to um, execute this test. Um, and the way we do that is by saying float. Why won't it tab complete that? Is it because I'm in the middle? Yeah. Float literals. Okay. All right. Well, this is something that I can work with. Um, it doesn't know how to parse, oh, it doesn't know how to evaluate this instruction, f32.const. Okay, well, I know how to, impl well, I don't know how to implement it. I know how to start implementing it. Um, in fact, this is making me grateful that I did that refactoring where I am just piping everything through evaluate because now, um, sorry, here, Oh no, these are i32. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Ignore me. I thought I was going to save having to do the work in two places, but of course, uh, all of the assertions are talking about i32s, not f32s. The, I, the f32s only appear in these functions that are being called. Um, so at the moment, I've got this huge... I mean, this is the only thing that's really... Or, this is the most questionable thing in my implementation at the moment is that there's just this huge case statement and this case in it is huge because it's got another case statement inside it. So this one here in i32 or i64, um, yeah, that's right, Mark. You might recognize Ruby pattern matching from a talk that you saw, um, which as far as I know, has still not escaped. You know, if there's a video of it, then it hasn't escaped Andy's hard drive. So maybe you're one of, maybe that was, you know, there was a talk at that conference that said, this talk is not being recorded and only the people in this room will get to see it. 
I think maybe all of the talks are like that. Um, so yeah, I've got this whole section here that deals with I32 and I64 dot blah instructions. Um, oh, except look, I've got this, I don't know, I, 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 my eye immediately went to that, but of course I've got the I32, I64 const. I pulled those out. I forgot I'd done that. Um, so I'm tempted, again, for the sake of like regularity, I'm tempted to just sort of, uh, yeah, I'm tempted to just copy this. Um, because I know that I'm going to need F64 here. Um, if, you know, I've, I've seen it. <laughs> you know, here it is. So I'm going to need that sooner rather than later. So I think, and for the same reason that it was useful for me to pull the I32, I64 dot const instructions out, that reason being they are the only instruction, or well, I guess apart from... Hmm, apart from return, they're the only instruction... Oh, local.get. <laughs> it's special because it doesn't evaluate his argument is what I was trying to take a run up to saying there. So I'm just going to, I'm going to have the same thing here. I'm going to say the, if the instruction is f32.const, I don't actually need it, but let's just, I think even though this is unnecessary because this could just be 32, not 43, um, I'm going to leave this here just, again, for intentional symmetry. And in fact, I can see that if I wanted to, I could actually combine these two. You know, because the only difference between F32 const and I32 const is the F and the I. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try and control myself and just say, well, let's just copy the code that pulls the, the number of bits out of the instruction, because I've already written that code. And then this thing that says interpret integer should just be interpret float. Job done. Programming's easy. Oh, I haven't implemented interpret float. Okay. Well, sometimes it's not that simple, is it? Um, right, well, I mean, this should really just be called parse float because that's what it's doing. And this should really be called parse integer because it's, you know, even though... It, even though it's come out of the parser, what the parser has produced is just a string with an integer or a float in it. And then we, the interpreter here, you know, I've called it interpret float to try and make myself feel better about the fact that I'm in the interpreter. But really, the interpreter is doing some parsing here. So this goes back to the, um, the point that, I've forgotten their name, sorry. The point that that person who left the comment was making, which is that um, maybe... Maybe the parser's not doing enough work here, and this is another case where really, by the time we're interpreting this code, we shouldn't have to be dealing with stuff like this. So this is, I'm just gonna make a note of that because uh, I've been writing down things as they occur to me. Um, the interpreter is doing at least some of the parsing work, i.e. parsing integers and floats. Really, these should already be, be parsed and uh, their representation uh, stored in the AST before the interpreter gets involved. So that's, I'm not gonna do anything about that. I'm just gonna note it. Um, anyway, let's find where interpret integer is defined and then we can simply implement interpret float. Uh, so we get a string, we've got a bit width, which is gonna be 32 or 64. Um, just realizing that the width is not, this bit width is not gonna be super helpful to me. Um, at this stage, uh, because I'm only, I'm only doing 32 bit. 32 bit floats. So there's a temptation to write like, you know, raise unless bits equals 32. Um, 
because I because I don't really want to okay I'm gonna leave that there for now just to be defensive because I don't want to have to for now, this is going to be difficult enough without me having to implement something that's completely generic and that takes a, takes account of the value of bits here. So I think I, I'm just going to hard code that this is 32, you know, in as much as you're welcome, you know, you can have any bit width you want as long as it's 32. Um, and then if I get to the point where I'm calling this with 64 bits or some other quantity of bits, I want it to loudly complain that I haven't, I haven't thought about how to do that yet. Um... So what am I being called with here? Um, so in this case, well, okay. M m maybe the thing to do is to say like, uh, case string end. So I kind of need to do something with this string. But right now I go... <laughs> I don't have any implementation that knows how to parse anything. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, in foo. Okay, so I sort of had a a syntactically invalid case statement there. Um, so I've put this in just so that, because I, what I wanted to see was this, you know, the error message that I get from no matching pattern error tells me what I failed to match. So yeah, as we expected, nan. So I realize I've just sort of pulled out of thin air the idea that I want to represent these as integers, but that's just because of the thinking time I had at the end of the previous stream when I was looking at these and I did some little experiments in the terminal to see how Ruby represented NAN and it turns out that it does actually, oh yeah, okay. So it turns out that it does, that the representation of not a number, the default representation of not a number in Ruby does actually match the one that WebAssembly is looking for here. So it's default representation of not a number, 32 bits, is this, and Ruby's is the same. So, in that case, the temptation here is to, I'm just going to open up the pack documentation in a, um, in a tab, uh, docs, Ruby Lang, uh, array method pack. There it is. Cause I think I'm, it's quite likely that I'm going to be referring to this. Um, Why? Why? Sorry. The reason I'm making it so big is because the, the font inside here is extra tiny. Um, so, yes. Um, what I was saying is that if, is that we can get a Ruby flow like this. Like I was thinking, am I gonna have to create the bit pattern that represents a NAN myself? But I don't think I am because I can just say float NAN. Um, I can pack that into a, into a sequence of bytes, which in root, the only, uh, well, not the only, but the choice of data structure that the Ruby standard library uses to represent a sequence of bytes is a string, which is a bit confusing, but nonetheless, here we go, single precision native format. So that, in fact, you can see we're just by reading these bytes, I, I talked about this bit yesterday, but just by reading these bytes in the string, you can see that we're pretty close to 7F C0000, um, because this is little endian, it's got the, uh, least significant byte first and then the most significant byte is at the end here so those bytes are like in the wrong order but that doesn't matter because we don't want to store it as a string we want to store it as an integer and to store it as an integer I have to unpack this into a 32-bit integer uh, which is I know I did this literally yesterday but I can't remember these directives longer than in fact, no, I said the word long. I guess this is a long and this is a short, so maybe I could remember them. I don't know why this is Q quite long. Um, 
Okay, so L is a 32-bit unsigned, and because it's it, this doesn't specify whether it's big or little endian, but it's the same endianness as F. So I know that if I've packed it with F, then I can unpack it with L, and that will give me this number. And then if I look at that as a as a hex number, that is what the test was expecting: seven FC and then five zeros. So this number here is what I want to represent that float as. So I'll just copy this, <laughs> is the point. Um, I mean, obviously I could just paste in that, literally that integer, but I think this better expresses what it is that I'm trying to get done here. Um, so I think that's probably fine. Um, At the very least, that's going to give us a different error. Um, I feel like there was something else I wanted to say about this, but I can't remember what it was. Oh, yeah, I remember. I got distracted by the auto-completion here. That, um, I didn't talk about this specifically, but I'm using unpack1 here because, somewhat annoyingly, pack and unpack. Pack turns an array into a string. So... I'm always using it with a single thing, but you can put multiple. I could put multiple floats in here. I could put two nans, and I could put two Fs, and then it would pack those two numbers next to each other in a string. And then when you call unpack, I could say, well, unpack the first one as a float, and then unpack the second one as a long, and it would give me a float and a long integer. So in general, pack goes from an array to a string and unpack goes from a string to an array. But because here I know that I'm packing a one element array, it's kind of annoying to get this one element array back, which is why this unpack one method exists. If you know that, it, that you only want to unpack one thing, this will just unwrap the array for you. Um, so yeah, that's why I'm using that. Um, so, am I done? Does everything work? Well, it would appear that um, f32.const works, but now we've got this reinterpret f32, i32.reinterpret f32, which I think I found the documentation for this um, yesterday. Uh, execution, numerics, math jacks, um, reinterpret, yes. Oh yes, I remember talking about this at tedious length last time. Um, so the TLDR of this is give me the number, so this is like reinterpret a float as an int for example, and it says, well, get the sequence of bits that represent that flow and then return the integer whose representation is that same sequence of bits. So, um, again, I'm just hypothesizing that this piece of concrete syntax here, i32.reinterpret f32, corresponds to this mathematical function in the spec because I still haven't had any joy trying to understand exactly how to make that connection inside the text format section of the spec. But... I'm getting by, I'm like muddling through so far with this kind of very hazy uh, Zatz understanding of what these instructions do, so I see no reason to stop now. Um, anyway, sorry, I'm blathering. Long story short, I don't think this instruction does anything because we are already, internally, we are already representing floats as, in this case, a 32-bit integer. So... I think I can implement this as a function that just does nothing or rather just returns its argument. It's going to have to evaluate this. So this is, I can plug this into the, to this big nested case statement that knows how to, that pre-evaluates its arguments. So here we've got this kind of blanket, recursively evaluate all of the arguments. And then I can just plug it in at the bottom here. I can say um, in 
reinterpret f32 value, which, which again has been evaluated, I think I can just return that value. And in fact, I, I guess I could have put that in as just an alternative there. But I think it's, I think it's more useful to have this as a separate, uh, not more useful, but more clear to have this as a separate thing because there's something subtly different going on here, which I think the reason why this is a no-op is because this mask is here, whereas the reason this is a no-op is a different reason. It's because of the coincidence of representations. It's incidental that this is a no-op. If I change the representation of floats internally, this certainly would not be a no-op. This would have to decode that representation and then represent it as an integer, whereas here, um, this is not incidentally the identity. This, this, the purpose of this instruction is basically to return the same value, and we're not converting between um, floats and integers. It's just supposed to truncate its representation, which is something that, that we do automatically. So that's a long-winded way of saying I'm going to keep these two separate because I feel like it's the right thing to do. Um, hey, it works. All right, we now support nan awesome um so what done i actually do i have done this i think i think that this is a single change you know this is basically implement yeah this is just implement f32 const um implement the f32 dot const or, or you know yeah, implement the f32 const instruction. Um, there is a caveat on that. Uh, at the moment, the only floating point number we know we know how to parse is nan, which isn't going to be enough, but it's a start. Um, we're representing 32-bit floating point numbers as the 32-bit integer whose bits are the same as the IEEE 754 uh, rep single precision representation. of that number. Uh, this is because we can already see that we're going to need features of, well, uh, going to, well, I'm going to say, well, this is mainly because, <laughs> this is because a WebAssembly uses IEEE 754 um, floating point numbers. And I can evidence that with a link to that numeric section of the uh, documentation. Where was the floating point section there? So that's the main reason and B, we can already see that we're going to need some features of IEEE 754 floating point numbers, e.g. Uh, NAN payloads, negative NAN, which Ruby does not expose, which Ruby's float class does not expose. So we can't just use float as our native representation. And I talked a bit last time about the fact that maybe I could have come up with a different representation. Um, you know, maybe a, I could have dealt with the payload or the sign issue by just having like a you know, a compound value that's like a pair of a boolean and a flow or a triple of a boolean and a flow and an optional payload or something like that. But 
it just felt like this was gonna you know it's very convenient to be able to do this right that like the spec is very concerned everywhere both for integers and flows with the bitwise representation of the values and so it feels like staying close to the bitwise representation is going to make our lives a bit easier um maybe i should write this here um this wasn't the only option we could have created some kind of um yeah data structure for storing everything we need in addition to a float um but the spec talks a lot about the bitwise representation of i e 754 floats so it feels as though staying close to that representation is going to make our lives easier. But this is just a guess. Be completely clear about what, if anything, I'm thinking at this stage. <laughs> um, okay, where was I? Oh, I haven't finished committing. Um, so this is implement the, what is it, I32 reinterpret. Oh, this makes me think like, what would happen if this was I64 reinterpret F32? Then this isn't right. Okay, um, I'm going to, again, do something defensive here. Arguably the same applies here. Uh, do I want to worry about this? Yes, because I can imagine this being something that wastes a lot of my time in future. Raise unless bits equals 32. So the same thing I did down here. Like, the implementation of interpret flow really only makes sense for 32-bit numbers. And I, I realize I didn't have to put this instruction in this. The, the case we're inside here is all the stuff that's all generic for 32-bit and 64-bit integers. So I didn't have to put this inside here so that I'm getting i32 and i64 dot reinterpret f32. Um, but it's so convenient to put it here. I think just guarding against accidental... Yeah, this shouldn't be the identity function if this is... I haven't really thought about this. Maybe it would be, because then you just get zeros in the, the top 32 bits, but I'm, I'm just being cautious. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I, I'm just going to type in a little bit of the spiel I gave about this. Um, this is incidentally the identity function because we've chosen to represent floating point numbers as their integer equivalent, which is what this instruction is supposed to convert floating point numbers into. But if we change our minds about how floating point numbers should be represented internally, we'll need to change the implementation of this instruction to match. Okie doke. All right. Clear. So now, let us continue. Right. We do not have, we cannot match plus nan. That's no good, is it? Um, I am going to say string equals string dot delete prefix plus. Like, rather than turn this into a regular expression or something, the plus prefix is doesn't mean anything. It's implicit. Um, so I think we should just strip it if it appears. And I know I, this could be case string dot delete prefix, but I think 
doing some separate, uh, as I did last time, sort of separating out the preparation of the value and then the computation we're going to do with it. As this code gets more complicated, I think I have come to believe that there's benefit in kind of separating those concerns spatially in the code so that it doesn't all just turn into a big kind of katamari of let's do everything. Um, so, excellent. That is already working. Um, so, um, support... Uh, I'm just trying to think how I want to phrase this. Um, I suppose I'll just say support uh, explicitly positive NAN, basically. Um, the plus is implicit, so we can just remove it. Like, I don't think that means anything. Let's, I feel like I should be trying harder to substantiate these things with, um, at least looking at the spec, if not citing the spec. So floating point, so this is like the, this is the syntax of floating point numbers. Um, <laughs> again, this is a, <laughs> I can see what they've done here, but this is a very strange, way of representing this. Um, again, you could reconstruct the whole notion of positional, the meaning of positional numeral notation for numbers from the way that they've recursively defined um, frac here. Because they're saying as you as you make it longer, you successively divide its value by 10. Um, Anyway, uh, why doesn't this say anything about signs? It's got something here about the sign of the exponent. P num dot. So is it in num? Oh, yeah, because I guess the bit before the dot is like, is an integer, right? So there's probably something up here. Yeah, okay, fine. Um, num. Although this doesn't, I mean, there's it, they define sign up here where, oh, right, okay, I should have, I should have. <laughs> this is where you start. What is the syntax of F32? Well, it is a sign followed by a, uh, um, a 32-bit floats magnitude, and then a magnitude can be inf or nan or nan with a payload. So this nan colon, this is what this is what I hypothesized looking at that syntax yesterday. Um, when I say that syntax, I mean this. So this is saying, well, I mean, I suppose I'm still I'm still hypothesizing that this is the payload, but it is certainly is. Um, so a magnitude can be one of these special strings, which comes after the sign, or it can be a float or a hex float, which is the sort of more conventional notation. So um, anyway, I suppose the point is that a sign is either plus or minus or epsilon, which is the empty string in this notation. So this is saying this, this double headed arrow here is like an interpretation function, if you like. It's sort of saying like, well, how do... If I find the character plus, what should I interpret that as? Oh, you should interpret it as a positive magnitude number. If you see a minus sign, you should interpret that as a negative magnitude number. If you see nothing, if you see the empty string, you should interpret that as a positive. Um, so actually, I can, I can substantiate this claim. Unbelievably, I didn't really think that the spec was going to be quite that pedantic but it sure is so we don't need the plus sign we can just take it out um and now we've got the problem of negative nan so 
I think it's easy for me to fix this no matching pattern error because I can just say delete prefix minus. Job done. I told you that programming was easy. Oh, hey, Matt, welcome. Thank you for, thank you for joining us this evening. I don't know why I say us. It's just me and Mark and Zeta, I suppose. Um, but that's more than one. Um, oh, hi, Nat. Nat is also here. <laughs> um, right, so like I said, the good news is I fixed the no matching pattern error. The bad news is this value actually is different. Um, and so it needs to be encoded differently. And Ruby can't do that. So just for, at least for Chris, who wasn't here yesterday, if I say, please encode, I mean, you can say negative NAN, that's totally a thing that you can, that's a, a Ruby value. Sorry, let me just, I can't, I, I've already forgotten the F and the L. Um, if only I knew something with the initials FL that would help me to remember this. Hmm. Um, so yes, if I pack a negative NAN into a sequence of bytes and then unpack them into an integer, you will notice that this is the same value as I got before. So that's upsetting. If I pack that integer into a sequence of bytes and then unpack them into a float, I do get a NAN, but it's not a negative NAN. So Ruby just throws away the information that this is a negative NAN. Um, so that's annoying. Um, so we're going to have to deal with that ourselves. Um, so back in the day, this interpret integer used to know whether the value was negated um, until I decided to throw caution to the wind and just let Ruby deal with it by saying, by calling 2i, because 2i knows how to deal with the minus sign. But here, well, firstly, well, I mean, I've, I've been very, oh, a flying llama. Yeah, that's, that's a good idea, Mark. That's what I should have been reaching for. Um, I've been distracted by the flying llama. Oh yeah, I wanted to demonstrate that nan uh, to float does not work. You know, in general, um, in the, well, in, in the sort of n normal case, in the usual case, I'm trying to avoid the word normal for a, a f IEEE 754 related reason. In, in, in the usual case, Call, you can just call to fl to f right and so but because the very first example that this spec has got me working with is a string that 2f does not support and does not recognize that's why i haven't just tried to fall back to exactly the same strategy here because the very first example is one that that ruby doesn't support i mean i don't know can, is there anything that it can like i don't think you know, I don't think it's the case that you can always round trip. You can't stringify any float and then expect to call 2f and get the original float back. Like it just, that property doesn't exist in Ruby. So I don't think there is any string. You know, it's not like I can just search and replace nan and replace it with, you know, nan with capital N's in it, for example, um, and have it just work. So anyway, I can't use 2f is the point. Um, but yeah, for interpret integer, I was doing this thing where I said like, s not signed, negated is string start with, I always want to say starts with, and I don't understand why it isn't that. I mean, it, you know, Ruby was written by someone for whom English is not their first language. So, and th their English is infinitely better than my Japanese so I will not nitpick that choice but I'm the reason I always think about it is because I think is this is that the reason or is there another reason that I'm that my brain can't absorb 
but I always get it wrong. I mean, I might have got it wrong now. Maybe it is starts with, I can never remember. Um, just like I can't remember the number 754. Um, right. So the reason I'm doing this is because we need to know whether this is negated or not. Um, because that affects the uh, bit pattern that we return. Um, and just to be completely clear about this, I think that the bit pattern that we return so this exponent, despite the despite me refusing to talk about how this is encoded, if all of the bits in the exponent are one, then that has a special meaning. Because that's sort of maxing out the exponent, right? And maxing out the exponent is sort of reserved in IEEE 754 to mean, well, it means it's either infinite or that it's a NAN. And if any of these fraction bits if they're all zeros, then that's an infinity. And obviously you can make negative infinity by setting the sign bit to one. Uh, if you set any of the fraction bits, then it's a NAN and this chunk of fraction bits, which are essentially unused, it's very wasteful, but they are the payload of the NAN. So if you've got a fully fledged IEEE 754 implementation, which arguably Ruby's is not really, um, you are able to store sort of metadata of your choosing inside a not a number value and then that can flow through your program like any other data and you can use it to piggyback something or other you know I don't I don't know anything about scientific computing I don't know what people use that for but you know in principle you can squirrel away whatever value you want in there anyway point is um NANs look like this, or at least the top bits of a NAN look like this. And in fact, I think what I discovered last time is that this is both what Ruby uses as its canonical representation of a NAN and also what WebAssembly uses. So I think if I take out these spaces, let's just double check that. Oh, silly Mac OS with its inserting an asterisk. Yeah, that's the same number as we saw up here. Yes. So, anyway, this is the standard NAN. The one that we want is the same as that one, but with the top bit toggled on to indicate that it's negative. And I would hope that if I plug that in, 429... 0772992, then that's what the test should be expecting. 4290772992. So all we have to do is return this value. Again, I could just hard code that value in here, but I think what I want to do is say something like, you know, value equals that. Um, and then say, if negated, value, I can use or equals here to sort of clobber it. Uh, I'm, I'm going to return value at the end. Um, so what I want to do is take this original value and or it with one and then I don't know why it's not letting that auto repeat. I don't know how many zeros is the right number there. Um, probably a few more because zeros. Oh no, or a few less. Yeah, a few less. Oh, don't make me think. Um, I'm just going to put loads in. Um, so we just have to do this. So we just have to do this, you know, bitwise or not, not Boolean or. Um, <laughs> I'm just, you know, I just couldn't resist thinking about that. It's obviously wider, isn't it? Um, to set that top bit. Um, let's see that in action. So if I or this with 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. There we go. That's the magic number. 42907729902. Um, and of course, that agony I just put you through of me typing 31 zeros is completely unnecessary because this can just be one shifted left 31 times. Um, so that's all I need to do. Um, value or equals one shifted left 31 times. I mean, I suppose it doesn't cost me anything to write this as bits minus one. That's why it's 31 is because these bits are, well, I was going to say these bits are zero indexed, but for the purposes of shifting left, if I, the number one is in the rightmost bit and, and I'm, I want the leftmost bit, so it's sort of a fence post error you could make here, to get from the rightmost bit to the leftmost bit in a 32-bit number, you have to shift left 31 times because if you don't shift at all, it stays in the same position. And yeah, well, anyway, I didn't, you don't need me to explain how numbers work. Um, so I think, I think this is going to work. I think I'm doing the right thing here. Um, yes, indeed I am. Great. Um, support negative nan. Um, to make uh, the existing nan negative, we just need to toggle. We just need to set um, bit 31 uh, because that's the sign bit in single precision IEEE 754. And I think, again, I think I've just got a citation for that already here. So, Oh, hi, Carl. Good. I'm glad that you've, <laughs> I'm glad that you have learned about the bitwise shifting in Ruby. Yeah, we've, there's already been in previous uh, streams, we've done a fair bit of bit twiddling um, to do things like, um, so there's some stuff here for like doing ro rotate left and rotate right. So there's all kinds of um, shift right and shift left. So we've, we've already had to implement a load of integer instructions that involve, and it's like count leading zeros, count trailing zeros, population count. So if you're interested in bitwise manipulation in Ruby, there's actually lots of interesting examples here of, of how to implement that um, codes up on GitHub. Um, what was I saying? Oh, that's a sign bit in single precision, IEEE 754. And I'm going to cite, because this is essentially the m world's most compact representation of how IEEE 754 works. And what I mean by that is that what they're saying is these things on the left are explaining what sequence of bits represent various numbers. So it's like the last two cases are positive and negative infinities positive and negative not a numbers um this second one is the so-called subnormal numbers which i haven't talked about because we don't need to talk about them at least not yet so we can just ignore that one and then the top one is talking about the normal numbers the which is why i was avoiding the word normal before because it actually means something specific here but let's just say these are almost all of the numbers that we would care about are formatted in this way and so what this is saying is the sequence, again, it's parameterized on n, which in our case is 32. This is 32 bits. It's saying that um, the way that you represent a number that can be written as one plus some fraction m times two to the power of minus m times some exponent is this sequence of bits. But you, so these are supposed to be concatenated together, essentially. And you can see that it just begins with the sign bit. So although it's a little bit cryptic, this is sort of explaining to you what the format is. And this thing about adding the bias onto the exponent is the thing about um, 
encoding that I said I wasn't going to talk about. Again, not yet. Um, actually, how does this know? The reason why I was shying away from... The reason why I wanted to raise unless bits equals 32 is that we need to know... There are some arbitrary parameters here. You need to know that if n is 32, you need to know that the exponent is 8 bits wide. I mean, really, I suppose that's the only parameter because assuming the sign bit is always just one bit, which it is, then the exponent is some arbitrary width that a human being has chosen to be about big enough to be useful, but not so big that it uses up too much of the storage. And then you do need to know how many fractional bits there are, but of course that's just that's just the rest. So, but because the width of the exponent is arbitrary, I'm not sure i bits e, how is that, where does that parameter come from? And this, and I was thinking about this parameter m. Oh, that is defined here, m equals signific, signif of n and e equals expon of n. So these, let's just click on these. Right, <laughs> this is where the magic numbers live. If your if n is thirty two, if it's a thirty two bit float, then the exponent is eight bits. If it's sixty four, the exponent is eleven bits. And then these are the leftovers. You either get twenty three or fifty two bits. This is exactly what I said here of fraction, essentially. I don't know why it's called signif, significant bits. Um, oh, uh, this. Oh, of course. <laughs> I've literally got the word significant written there. It's just that I wasn't using the word significant. M is the significant cat whose most significant bit is one. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, all right, fine. Um, why the hell am I banging on about this? Oh, it's because I just wanted to link to this. Uh, I didn't want to link to this. I wanted to link to this. Binary flight point format. This fully justifies what I'm saying in this commit message. Okay. Um, Great. Uh, where are we at? Oh, we are at the world of payloads, or what I assume is the world of payloads. Okay, so let's talk about that for a second. So I suppose I've, I already have talked about it. Um, this is like a this is actually a NAN with a payload. This is a NAN where the payload is this 101010 uh, number. So if we if we had this payload, 0x4000000, uh, let's sprintf that as a 32-bit binary number and the zero there means pad it out with leading zeros if it if it if the number isn't naturally 32 bits wide which i was going to say in most cases but i guess it's exactly half of the cases it isn't um so this is what oh i i suppose i don't want a 32 bit number do i i want because we've got 23 bits to play with here, a 23-bit fraction in which to store our payload. So really, I want to see it as a 23-bit number. That's I realized that because I was like, why is that one hanging out in the middle there? Um, and the answer is, because it's actually the top bit of the fraction. Oh, okay, so I, I now understand what this is doing, which is it's recreating the same NAN, but with an explicit payload. So this is sort of, this is really just testing that the syntax is supported because this is not trying to modify the payload of the default NAN, which already has apparently this bit pattern in the fraction bits. Um, so I assume when we look at the test, uh, pl right, plain NAN, okay, that makes sense. Do you think that's a, is that a joke about Indian food or is that, I don't know. Um, I like to think that it is. Um, yes. So this is not expecting 
this is the same value as we had for the positive nan and then just the you know unadulterated nan here um so it's so i don't well i was going to say i don't think we need to do any work here to actually fill in the payload um yeah okay i i've convinced myself of that because all we have to do is support all we have to do is recognize that syntax right so we need to <laughs> mark doesn't want to know what a negative naan tastes like yeah it sounds sounds awful um you've got to make sure that you eat all ones naan it's very rude not to um so i'm afraid that i'm gonna have to use my old friend a regular expression here i think um for which i apologize but it feels hard to avoid i'm just thinking about is is there a nicer way than this of doing it Um, the reason I'm hesitating is because I regretted it last time when I used a regular expression. But thinking this through, it feels just completely inevitable that I'm going to have to do that here. Because the syntax of these things is complicated syntactically. So I think I'm going to have to... Oh, in fact, this makes me realise there's... I could have used then. Uh, let me just do that here. I, I realise I'm... I realise I'm getting distracted here because I'm, I'm putting off the moment when I need to write that regular expression. Um... This is nice because I don't have to do any assignment. That's why I wanted to, oh, I deleted the wrong thing. Um, so now I've chained this onto the end. Sorry, I know this, I know this is just a, uh, oh, but then I have to, is that really better? Because I have to, I have to return it in both cases. Wow, I've done a really good job of nerd sniping myself with this completely unnecessary refactoring, haven't I? Um, okay. Um, I'm going to stash that for now because I feel like I, I, I felt completely sure that that was definitely going to be better and now I'm not sure it is better. So anyway, anyway, we're back in it now. That, that 45 seconds didn't happen. Maybe I'm being um, optimistic about my estimate of how long I spent on that. Um, yes, okay, so this is going to have to be a regular expression because because that's how the world works um why don't i write it as an extended regular expression and at the very least we get to because before a big part of what i objected to was the fact that it was really working against the readability of the code to have everything all smashed together. So I think maybe writing an extended regular expression will, for example, allow me to put the anchors in here without them interfering quite so violently with the actual content of the of the of what I'm matching. So I think that's probably okay. So yeah, how this works is. last regex is going to be rearing its ugly head again isn't it i can already feel it disgusting anyway the way this works is we've got a sort of optional 
grouping here. Um, so, oh, in fact, I don't care about this. I don't want to capture this. So that that means non non capturing group. Um, because what there is is a colon followed by 0x, if we go back to that syntax of values. Uh, where was it? Nan colon 0x. So I'm sort of trying to match both of these at the same time, I guess. I want to either just match Nan on its own, or I want to match Nan colon 0x, and then it's followed by a hex number. Um, where's that defined? Oh, this is just in the syntax of integers. So I already know what hex numbers look like. I mean, it is defined up here, but I, I, I know what a hex number looks like. Um, what it looks like is 0 to 9, A to F, one or more times. And this part I do want to capture. I still don't know if this is the NAN payload, do I? I'm That's still just an assumption. And the reason I'm saying that is because I want to give this a name. Um, let's check that assumption. Oh, here we go. Furthermore, arbitrary NAN values may be expressed providing, by providing an explicit payload value. So yes. I mean, I suppose we'd basically verified that by, I mean, it could have been a coincidence that it was the same value, but that's clearly too good to be a coincidence. So yes, okay, it is the payload. So this is going to match one or more hex characters and store them in this payload group. Um, mm, forgive me. I really don't want to do this and I think maybe I'm going to not do it, but I'm just bear with me for a second. I'm going to put this in just so that I can complete this thought and then we'll get rid of it. Uh, the reason why I think, uh, the reason why I'm reaching for a match object here, having uh, a match data object, having removed match data previously, is that previously I could get away with doing stuff like split, like it, a, the regu the operation of the regular expression was kind of overkill. Hi Klaus, welcome. Um, you know, I actually don't need the match data to get the number and the instruction out of this because it's good enough to just split on a dot and then use slice to look for a number. Um, but now we've got into a syntax where you can't really, I mean, I well, I can see that I sort of could if I just looked for a sequence of hex digits. But the problem is a zero is a hex digit, but it doesn't that's not the payload, it's just... Anyway, I think regular expressions are sort of necessary at this point or something that works like a regular expression, so I might as well use a regular expression. Um, so I think I'm going to need that. So regardless of how I get the match data, I, I'm, I'm going to need it. Um, and then I'm saying payload equals match uh, payload. Um, and then that is, I can interpret that as a 16 bit integer. Um, what will that be? So that's payload is going to be, um, nan. What I'm interested in is what do we do when there's no payload? Um, is nil, right? Right, so I can't do this. Um, so I guess it's, I guess what I need to do is say like, 
unless the payload was nil, then, you know, so essentially we're saying like, this logic that we're about to do to extract the payload and splat it into the bottom 23 bits of the NAN, um, only do that if the if this regular expression actually found a payload. And obviously I could have written two separate, you know, I could have done in NAN and then a separate one for the one with the payload. So it's my, you know, it's because I've decided to smush these two concerns together into a single regular expression with an optional capture group in it that I'm having to think about this at all, but them's the breaks. Um, okay, so I've got the payload. I've interpreted it as a 60, as a 16, I've interpreted it as a hexadecimal string. And so now I've got an integer that is the payload. And so now I can just, what do I want to do? I'm just thinking about the bitwise operations that we want to do here because What I'm thinking about is, sorry, I'm being very inarticulate. What I'm thinking about is this is the default NAN that we get from Ruby. Um, in this specific case, we're just gonna splat the same payload on top of it and there's actually no problem. But imagine that the payload was, um, Instead of being like that, imagine it was, you know, a one in the middle of that string of 23 bits. We can't just or it with, given that we've already got in value here, we've already got like the original, we've already got the number. Um, if we just or it with the original number, then the answer is then the result is going to be zero our eight exponent bits and then we're going to get a sort of transporter accident of both um you know we're going to get these two merged together which is not at all what we want so what we actually need to do is separately pick out the sign bit and the exponent and like zero out all of these other bits so that we can bitwise or these two values together. And because these are all zeros, um, we won't get, you know, the one that was present in the initial uh, NAN is not gonna pollute the payload that we end up with here. So I need to pick out the top, in this case, nine, bits and then or them with the payload um, so let's just think this through so the you know the number the magical number 9 is going to have to make an appearance here and like this is the kind of thing that made me want to write this at the start of the function because like how do i justify the magic number 9 it's just 9 because this is a 32 bit float and that's how many bits we need we care about here in the sign and the exponent um so we're going to mask 9 bits and what we want is In order to get, in order to zero out all of these bits, what we need to do is make a mask that looks like one, 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 one. So nine ones, and then and it with the original float, to, and that will retain whatever the top nine bits are, and everything will be zeroed out because these are all zeros, um, and so and at zero with anything is zero. So. 
So firstly, I need to make this mask of nine bits, which I which I can do. Um, if I want nine bits, what I do is shift one to the left nine places. That's almost everything I do. Um, that gives you, uh, this is 10 bits, right? Yes, that gives you a 10 bit number but then it but that's the smallest possible 10 bit number so if i then subtract 1 from it i get a 9 bit number where all the bits are set that's operator precedence for you so that's what i want i want to do i want to shift it so um ma um yeah mask i suppose i suppose that's okay so I want one shifted to the left by mask bits. And then I want to do minus one. And so far, this is not very different to what the mask helper does. Where is that? Oh, it's right at the bottom. So you can see this is doing the same thing. One to the pa one shifted left, however many bits, and then we subtract one from it. Um, so this is making a similar kind of mask, but the difference here is that it needs to be shifted to the left to be in the right position. Um, and how many bits to the left is it? Again, there's a lot of potential for an off by one error here. Um, if we shifted it to the left 32, then it would be completely outside. It would be it would be just outside of what we want. So I think, you know, if it was a one bit mask, we would shift it left 32 minus one, and then it would just peek in at the topmost bit. So I think we can just do 32 minus nine um, th bits is 32, um, and then nine is mask bits. So even though I've got some magic numbers in this function, like one of them is passed in as the only pos as the only supported value of the bits argument, and the other one, at the very least, has got a name here. So I'm going to try not to repeat the nine. You know, I I'm going to try not to do. You know, I'm going to going to try not to put. You know, twenty one in here. Uh, that's not right. Twenty two, twenty three. 23, because it's 32, not 30. Um, this is an example of the extremely complicated mental gymnastics that I that I can do in my brain. Subtract numbers and get the answer wrong. Um, okay, so I've got my mask. And then I need to... Um, Well, what I need to do is now make the two different parts and smush them together, which is going to be mask and value. So this is the bitwise and to mask out those top, to, to only get those top nine bits of the float. And then I want to or in, can I, can I safely assume the payload is not going to overflow the fraction? Um, so I'm trying to think, should I call this function here? But it's a bit annoying because I've got a local variable called mask. Um, top mask. Should I mask this? Uh, yes. Yes, I believe that's the right amount. Yeah, good question, Chris. Is it, whose error is it if the payload is too large? Or yeah, I suppose, I suppose what you're saying is, would it be an error? Because here I'm not, I'm just gonna silently Yeah. 
Yes, you're quite right. So here, in the syntax, it says it's an error if the, if the, well, it would be a syntax error to write this with a hex number that was, um, because this significant of n, um, is like, this is saying the maximum representable number, or this is, this number here is actually one more than the maximum representable number, which is why this is n is less than. So you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and semi-interestingly, the reason if the, the reason this is one less than or equal to n rather than zero less than or equal to n is because if the payload was zero, it wouldn't be a nan anymore. It would be an infinity. So we have to make sure that at least one bit is set, which means that you can't actually have a zero payload here. Um, but you're right. I think arguably it would be a syntax error. It'd be a parsing error if it was greater. Um, right now, nobody is checking that. Uh, so how do I feel? Anyway, Chris, I think you've convinced me that I shouldn't be doing this. I shouldn't be silently masking it. Um, okay, well, I'm, what I'm going to do is ignore this problem for right now. Uh, cause if I try to anticipate every possible problem in this, I'm going to lose my mind. So, um, Is it clearer? Because I was just going to assign this to value. Anyway, what I'm saying is I'm going to punt on this. And if there's a if there's a test that checks that this is supposed to be some kind of error, then we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, it feels like if this is in the spec, it should be in those tests somewhere, but who knows? And I'm ignoring all of the assertions that are about syntactic validation at the moment. I'm just focusing on the ones that return values. So that really feels like a problem for the future, which I like. Um... I was just hesitating there to say, like, is it clearer to do this or to break it up into saying, well, first the value gets masked and then the value gets payloaded? Um, well, I mean, this is a bit presumptuous because I don't know if this code is right. Ah, it is right. Wow. Look at this. Holy shit. <laughs> Um, okay, well, not only is it right, the reason I said a bad word is because it's actually churning through all of the NANs because it's hit infinity. So just implementing... I remember there was a point in time, tens of minutes ago, where I thought, if not said... All I have to do is implement this regular expression and not even bother blitting the payload into the NAN because that because this one is going to pass anyway. Um, and I'll be able to make a commit that just successfully parses NANs with a payload and that one will work. But then I forgot that that's what I was trying to do and I've accidentally done the whole thing. Um, yeah, nantastic. Thank you. I agree. Um, so that's, yeah, I got a bit over enthusiastic there, but this was, you know, I'm glad this works. Um, I'm not sure about this. Um, I think at the very least, what I'm going to do is put it this way round. So that you're sort of... It, it should be one of these two. It should either be like, start with the value and then do a series of violences to it and end up with the result, or we should break that violence out into multiple lines. I suppose I prefer just having a nice inline expression like this. So I'll just do that. I think that's neater. Um, so now we've got, we've got a sort of interesting situation here where we sort of, this is, I think, you know, this is why I was reaching for the sort of then situation, because we've got a series of well, a series of two modifications to the NAN value, right? Like we start off with like a totally vanilla NAN, um, but then if there's a payload, we do, we massage the value a bit. And then if there's, a, um, if it's negated, then we massage it again to set the sign bit. 
but I think I'm just going to leave it like this for now. I'm always sort of uncomfortable with this pattern where you like assign something and then you've got a load of crap that happens to it in the middle and then the last line of the method is just the name of a local variable because you want to return that. I'd much, I would rather have some kind of, you know, then or tap or something that's going to like chain an operation onto the end of it. But um, having to turn these into conditionals that say like else value sort of feels a bit gross. So I'm just going to leave it as it is for now. Anyway, that's quite an esoteric complaint for me to be making at this juncture. Um, this feels like a very credible commit that something like um, support NAN payloads. Um, and I'm going to add Chris's point about um, as Zeta pointed out. Is that your username, Chris? Yes. Um, as Zeta pointed out, um, it's a parse it's a parsing error for the payload to be too large to fit within the significant of the float. Um, so it doesn't feel right to m silently mask it to the correct size here. However, we're also not checking anywhere else uh, that is uh, an appropriate size. So in future, we might need to add uh, error handling to the parser so that it catches uh, inappropriately large payloads. Okie doke. Um, now, infinity. We have reached infinity. Excellent. Okay, so obviously the problem here is that this does not match. Inf. Uh, no matching pattern error. Right. So. Oh, I said I was going to get rid of the regex blast match. Um, am I? Am I, though? Yes. I think that I am because I very much dislike it I think that maybe this should just be if match equals um like that because I just felt so bad about using regex last match it gives me the willies so that does still work the other advantage of this is that I could extract this into a constant and not have it in line in the method here which is sort of pretty tempting um, uh, yeah I'm gonna do this because otherwise I'll just end up adding another bloody to do on here that says get rid of regex last match again and I'm you know, I'm sick of that guy. So let's say uh, use a conditional uh, instead of a case statement to uh, recognize NANs. Um, Although the reason I'm pausing is that I realize I've lost something semantically here, which is that previously it raised an exception if it didn't. So now I, th I think I should say else raise um, can't parse float string dot inspect. Um, so that seems justified. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, you know, this is no worse. 
obviously I would rather use pattern matching because pattern matching is great, but until pattern matching gains the ability to give me, either give me the whole match object or as a foot pointed out, and as I don't think I actually knew, if you put a regular expression with capture groups on the left-hand side of the sort of equals tilde operator, it actually assigns a local variable called payload in this case, but it doesn't do that inside pattern matches. So until someone pulls their finger out and implements something like this for pattern matching, I'm afraid I'm going to have to slum it with the conditionals um, like all the other programming languages. So I feel a bit better about that. I feel like I'm not making work for myself in the future. And now I think I am just going to pull this out. Um, so this is going to be something like what nan regexp. Uh, I think that's all right. I think that's all right. Yeah, I don't love it. Um. But such is such is Ruby. Um, what the heck? Oh yeah, okay. That is not the diff that I was expecting, but it is <laughs> understandably Git has decided that the contents of this regular expression is the bit that hasn't changed, and then the world has moved around it. So I can. There is no right answer to what has changed here, and I'm. I'm happy to accept this version of events even though it doesn't match my experience of having written that code um extract nan regex constant um uh what do i want to say um this just makes interpret float a bit easier to read I mean, obviously, you've still got a huge honking regular expression there, but at least it's not inline. Okay. Um, so what was I doing? Infinity. Yes, of course. So now, else if... Um, I mean, if it turned out that none of the rest of the things needed a regular expression, then I would drop into, you know, else, case... <laughs> No, I'm not going to prejudge that. Let's see where we end up, because this, of course, can just be if string equals inf. Uh, we want infinity. Um, it used to be the case that you couldn't straightforwardly get infinity in Ruby, but I think you just can ask for it now. Yeah, you used to have to do like 1.0 divided by 0 to get that, but then at some point they added this constant. What is it? capital infinity so again I'm just hoping that this is going to be the same representation of infinity oh of course it will be because there's no choice sorry I got I, I feel like I've been burned by nans in the past but positive infinity has just got the one representation in IEEE 754 so we should be good so like I said, this is this looks like a nan with an empty payload. Um, how far back in time do we have to go to get to those packs and unpacks? So yeah, uh, um, let's say I could do this with pack, but I can never remember how. Um, Thirty-two bits, please. So that's what nan looks like. Infinity, I think, should look exactly the same, except that one should be a zero, because we'll have a zero payload. Yep, that is the same. Okay, so there, I can see no reason why this won't just work. I'm expecting it to work. Did it work? Um, again, the fact that we can't see what these are doesn't really help. Um, I tell you what, how about 
when I print these out, how about I prefix them with the name of the function that's being invoked? Because then that that gives a little bit of context for like what this is saying. I mean, I'm pretty sure that, well, it has worked, hasn't it? Because the error was previously about not recognizing inf. And now, well, I mean, I guess it's possible that this is the very first one, but I would be very surprised if that's the case. Um, it's probably negative infinity or something. In fact, looking at the magnitude of this number, which is double the size of this one-ish, 42 is double 21. This is almost certainly negative infinity. Um, but yeah, I feel like I've slept too long on this problem. Um, and this is partly what was responsible for me not recognizing that it was the science division operation that was the problem with me extra with me using that recurse that uh, evaluate function for my expected value in the assertion last time so let's deal with this problem um what is the name of the function oh it's just name so if i do that oh yeah of course i was like i didn't put inspect but this is this problem. Uh, I wrote a note of it. Function names are currently raw symbols from the S expression, i.e. they have surrounding quotes and potentially contain escaped quotes. So, tough luck. Um, uh, uh, what about if I do this? Is that too rude? I don't think so, because that's significantly easier for me to read. So yeah, we can see there that infinity and positive infinity, i.e. the same, are working fine. Um, so okay, yeah, let's add this. Um, so this is just include uh, function name in assertion output. Um, this makes it much see at a glance. Oh, in fact, I should put, do the same thing down here. Sorry. This makes it much easier to see at a glance which, uh, which assertion is causing the problem um, when it fails. And that, you know, the, the urge to type that made me realize that this is actually most useful when it fails. So let's stick this in here as well. Yes, f32 dot negative infinity colon expected, right. I should have done that five, four streams ago, but it has only now occurred to me that it's that simple to add that information. So I actually wanna add that to my previous commit. Yes, that bit. Nice. Okay. Anyway, what was the rest of it? Oh yeah. Um, I suppose this is like support infinity, which is a bit vague, but that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Hopefully it's clear from context what I'm doing and the, the change is so trivial that I don't think there's anything interesting to say there. I'm just gonna leave it like that. Um, the thought occurs, should I be, should I be doing anything about the repetition here? You know, I'm using pack and unpack I think the answer is no. I don't. I really don't care. I don't care enough to start extracting that into a helper and stuff. Let's see where we end up. If I end up with this repeated five times inside this function, then that'll be a problem. But right now, that's totally fine. Um, so yes, negative infinity. Unsurprisingly, um, right. Well. Okay, so I suppose the temptation here is just to copy and paste this code. Um, well, not only is that the temptation, that is what I'm gonna do, but you know, 
I'm going somewhere with that. Um, that'll make the test pass. Right, negative infinity is now working. Um, but this is the kind of thing where... This really can just be left until later, I think. Like it doesn't need, this is not, this logic here, unlike the payload logic, this is not at all specific to, um, this is not at all specific to NANs. It's just a generally useful thing for floats. Um, so, I feel like I should... What did I do here? Yeah, just value, and then it returned unsigned. I think there's a similar thing going on here, which is that... I think this whole conditional should be assigning its result to value, and then this negation logic should move outside. It should be at the end of the whole method, because it's going to apply... You know, we always check to see whether the value is negated, and I think that needs to be bookended by always flipping the top bit on if the value is negated. So I'll, I'll commit this first, because this is the kind of... If I assign the result of the conditional, it's going to involve indenting everything, and then it's going to be very unclear what change I've made here. So I'm going to break this up into two pieces. Um, so I'll say uh, support negative infinity... Is this kind of coherent? Yeah. I just want to check that I'm not starting a new style of commit message for no reason, but that is that is what I've been writing previously. Um, so now that what I was talking about was like hoisting the assignment up to here and because I want to, indenting this whole thing. Um, so that means... I want to pull this out down here. Like that. And then all of these things go away. Well, not all of them. Um, does it worry me that I'm masking this? local variable not really it's fine but maybe it would be clearer if i didn't do that um in fact maybe it would be altogether clearer if i called this nan because that's what it is um whereas this has got a much vaguer name because i mean obviously i could call it float but apparently i didn't choose to call this integer so whatever maybe i should change that but i think it's now that i've hoisted this value variable to the top i think i would rather not repurpose it inside this conditional here um okay well firstly have i made a mistake i have not or at least not one that the computer knows about um, let's just say consolidate float negation. Um, I've renamed the inner value local variable to be called nan, which is both more specific and doesn't conflict with the outer local variable I'm introducing to hold on to the pre-negation value. Okay. So, I feel like we're getting somewhere with this. How are we doing for time? Not too bad. Oh. Right. I knew this was coming. And I mean, I'm actually really happy that we've got this far. How can this be here? Positive infinity, negative infinity. I don't understand why we've hit this problem. 
Oh, it's because it's in this flipping function, isn't it? Right, it's here. Gosh darn it. So the reason, the reason why I'm a little bit frustrated by this is because Ruby doesn't support this format at all. So this is, I don't really know what this is called. Um, I think of it as the C99, uh, I don't even know what it's called, hexadecimal float literal syntax. Um, oh, I mean, this isn't a very good explanation of it, but this will have to do. C99 supports floating point numbers that can be written in hexadecimal format. So rather than like the conventional format of a hex of a of a floating point number is something like one two three dot four five six e seven. So that means this is in base ten, obviously one two hundred and twenty three. 0.456 times 10 to the power of 7. That's just scientific notation. Um, C99, which is the version of which is the version of the standard for the the ISO standard for the C programming language that came out in 1999, lets you use a different syntax where you write it in hex. So you could do something like OX, I don't know coffee and <laughs> as you can see there's a problem because in base 10 e is used for the sort of scientific notation e means times 10 to the power of in scientific notation but you can't use it in hex notation because e is a valid digit in a hex number so they've gone with p um and then you can put what you know then you put the exponent after that you know, 1a. Oh, no, actually, I think the exponent is base 10. Yes. In hexadecimal format, the exponent... Sorry, this is very small. In hexadecimal format, the exponent is a decimal number that indicates the power of 2 by which the significant part is multiplied. So this is a real dog's dinner of, like... I, I think you can only put decimal numbers after the P. Let's just have a look. Or maybe maybe there was a better Google result for this. Um, anyway, yeah, I suppose this is... Oh, yeah, and of course I didn't talk about the fact that... Um, that, you, that there can be a, a, a dot as well. So I spent a bit of time before doing the, GC, doing the primary school lesson of... Here is how positional notation of in base 10 and base 1 work. I won't do it, but you can also do this in base 16, of course. You can, in base 16, you can do like digit, dot, digit, digit, digit. And that means the first, you know, where the digits are A, B, and A, B, C, and D. That means A times 16 to the power of naught plus B times 16 to the power of minus 1 plus c times 16 to the power of minus 2, and so on. So that's what's going on here, is that you can put a decimal, you can put a radix point in, and then this can be AAA, and then you put a p, and then you put a decimal number afterwards to say what it's times 2 to the power of, not 10 to the power of. So yeah, let's just look at this. 0x, this is just the prefix that indicates that it's a hexadecimal number. But what comes after the 0x? Oh, it's not a hexadecimal integer. It's a hexadecimal floating point number. So this is literally 1. Because in all bases, the rightmost column before the radix point is always the 1's column, even in binary. Um, so that's literally 1 point f now f is 15 so this is 15 sixteenths so that's what this is saying so this is 1 and 15 sixteenths times 2 to the power of 3 
So 1 and 15 sixteenths times 2 to the power of 3. So we have to both recognize this syntax and also somehow, you know, compute the appropriate flow. And I mean, of course, we can just sort of do the Ruby maths on this. Um, I'm just thinking about how we actually want to do that. Because actually there are two choices. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm moaning about this syntax, but I think the reason why you would want to write a floating point number in this syntax is that it's much easier to then map it onto the actual representation of the number. Um, because then the sequence of hex digits that you're writing here, I think correspond... I can't... I can't concentrate enough to be rigorous about this, but my intuition is that the sequence of hex digits that you write here kind of correspond directly to the bits in the fraction. Um, because although you're not writing this in base two, you're writing it in base 16, which is just a more compact representation of base two. You know, like every, every four bits of a binary number correspond exactly to a single digit of a hex number. So every hex number here is standing in for four binary digits in the fraction. So I think the fact that you're... Effectively, what I'm saying is this is sort of like if there was a syntax for writing out floats in binary, that would obviously correspond much more closely to the IEEE 754 representation of that float. Um, but it would be very long-winded because you'd have a really long sequence of ones and zeros so this hex notation is sort of a, a a more compact version of that you know it's allowing you to write in the sort of what the bits are going to be of the float and so the reason why that's giving me pause is that I'm thinking well I sort of have a choice here which is that either I do the arithmetic like this I guess I probably will do this now that I'm talking about it. Like, this is pretty easy to do. So maybe I'll just do the arithmetic and stop whining about it. Um, but the other option is to is to splat the bits <laughs> straight into the straight into the float. I'm just, I'm hesitating because it gets a little bit complicated because I don't know that there's any requirement I think you can have an arbitrarily sized, I mean, this doesn't in any way specify this, um, but I think you can have an arbitrarily sized number to the left of the decimal point here, which then makes it more complicated. Um, if it's been normalized like this, then it's easy. As long as it's one point something, then we can just read off the hex digits to the right of the dot here, and that, I think, gives you the bits in the fraction but what if this wasn't a one is it always a one? Oh, well in these cases it certainly isn't i mean yeah i suppose obviously it can't be because it could be zero so all of these have got a leading one so maybe it is always ox um Yeah, maybe. I mean, that would certainly make sense um, for the reason that I just outlined. Because why bother using that syntax otherwise? Um, let me just... Oh, I guess I, I was going to say... I was saying, oh, there's no specification of the syntax. But of course, we've got one of those at home. Um... I'm looking at the wrong. This is what I care about. Hex float. Hex flow is 0x followed by an arbitrary hex number. So it can be anything. And then again, here's the here's essentially the mathematics of how do you 
X and none. Is that just a digit? No, I think that's recursively a sequence of digits, yeah. So this can just be arbitrarily many X digits. So even though this test doesn't look like it uses anything other than one, I think syntactically there's n nothing preventing that being more than a one. Um, yeah, there's, and there's no restriction. Like here, there's a restriction on what you're allowed to write. Um, but here, the only restriction on when you're writing a F32 magnitude, the only restriction on hex float is that um, the interpretation of that is not positive or negative infinity. I don't really know what that means. Um, I suppose float, this float interpretation function must be able to return infinity. Maybe if the number's too large or too small, it can return positive or negative infinity. Yeah, if x is greater than or equal to the positive limit, then return positive infinity, else return negative infinity. Um, I guess that's what happens in Ruby if I, if I say, well, joke's on you, Ruby, I'm going to ask you to interpret this number. It's just going to say, oh, the interpretation function that turns strings into floats has got this kind of capping behavior, this kind of clamping, I should say, that instead of returning an error or anything, it just gives you positive infinity. So anyway, sorry, that's a distraction. The point is, it seems like you can write anything after the... Oh, I'm looking at the wrong thing. I'm looking at the wrong thing. Why didn't you tell me I was looking at the wrong thing? This is not it at all. This is the... Oh, oh no, maybe I was looking at the right thing. Yes, this is, yeah, the reason I scrolled down was to talk about these. <laughs> I scrolled down to talk about these restrictions on the right-hand side. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to yell. I take it back. It's not your fault. It's me. I got confused. It, it, I was looking at the right place, and there isn't any restriction on it. Um, so, anyway, the point is that I think I am I have talked myself into, let's just do the flip-in arithmetic. So yes, just to explain my thinking there in case it's not obvious, I'm thinking we can parse this string and yank out the various bits of it. So we can yank out the bit before and after the dot. We can yank out the bit after the P. And then we can use that to construct, to, 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 to do this calculation, right? Um, Is there any problem with that? I can't see a massive problem with that. Like here it calls them, in the syntax here it calls them P and Q. It's got the hex num that can be arbitrarily many hex digits. And then there's the hex frac. which can also be arbitrarily many hex digits. So I'm not quite sure what the difference between those two things are. Um, hex num is a hex digit or a hex num and an optional underscore followed by more hex digits. A hex frac. Oh, the difference here is the interpretation function. Okay, yeah. We, we don't have to worry about this, but this, this thing here that interprets the meaning of these digits, obviously, if these digits are appearing after a after a dot, they don't correspond to the same magnitude of number because instead of yeah, because there that's why there's this dividing by sixteen here, whereas up here um, it was multiplied by sixteen because as you add more digits, the number kind of gets bigger if you like. Whereas when you add more digits after the decimal num decimal point, the radix point the subsequent digits are kind of getting smaller and smaller. That's a terrible explanation, but that at least explains why there's a different syntactic category here. Um, yes, okay. So what I was saying was I can pull out P and Q from the syntax, and then I can just do the 
arithmetic. I mean, here it's saying P plus Q. So that's assuming that we've calculated the magnitude of the hex number before the dot and the magnitude of the hex number after the dot. And then we can just add them together. Um, and then we, and then if there's a P, then, you know, here's the general case, P plus Q times two to the power of E which is the exponent, even though it comes after a P. And the exponent here is just, is not hex num, it's num, which is a decimal number. So I was correct that this is, that web page I looked at was correct. It is a decimal exponent. So what is the point of all that stuff I just said? The point is we need to parse this thing. Um, let's start as we've begun here and say, <clears throat> Excuse me. So we need something like <clears throat> I'm just thinking about what to call it. What does what does this call it? Hex float. That'll do. Um so again, let's let's make a regular expression. <clears throat> and again, I think this is justified because the syntactic complexity of this is more than we're going to be able to cope with just using things like slice and split. So let's just be honest. I don't mind essential complexity. It's incidental complexity that frustrates me. And in this case, it feels like the complexity is sort of essential because the, the format is essentially complex. So... But I don't want to make it more complex than needed. So let's just focus on this is the string that we're hoping we're going to be able to parse. Just put that there as a reminder. So are you sitting comfortably? Then we will begin the string. And at some point we're going to want to end it. So that's what it's going to start to look like. Um, 0x. I'm, I'm thinking about the sign here, but I think we've already dealt with that. So we've already... Oh, that's, I've gone up. I've gone the wrong direction. Um, we already strip off the plus and the minus at the beginning of the string, which is actually a little bit distracting because the exponent is also going to have a uh, might have a sign in it so you can see here we've got p minus 149 but whatever we'll just have to deal with that um there's a sort of loss of regularity you know that the that the sign of the number is being stripped off before we even try to match it with the regular expression in some ways i'd be more comfortable if we were matching the sign as part of this because everything else in this regular expression is going to correspond to the grammar that we've got here of what numbers look like but life's too short for me to continue talking about that um so it starts with zero x i don't know why i keep looking at that i've got it right here um and then we're gonna match well i'll just i'll i'll, I'll go with my gut I'll shoot from the hip and then we'll correct this as it turns out inevitably to be incorrect because I think what we need is some hex digits, 0 to 9, A to F. Uh, and actually, I think I am going to put this in a capture group um, called P because that's what it calls it here. And I, I know that's a little bit cryptic, but I'm worried that I'm not going to be able to think of a meaningful name to give it. So I might as well give it a a name that is justified by reference to some kind of authority, which in this case is the actual grammar of the language. So, so this is the P, some hex digits. And then we've got a literal dot. And then we've got the Q, which is just more of the same. Uh, i.e. this. 
So in this case, zero dot zero. And then we've got a literal P, which is a little bit confusing because it's the same as this, but whatever. Um, and then we've got, what does it call it? E. And this. Now, I was going to use backslash D here, but I'm not going to. I'm going to use 0 to 9, again, to, to call out the distinction. If I made this just backslash D, it looks completely different to those two um, uh, group bits of um, range group syntax. Um, but by writing this out, not entirely longhand, semi-longhand, I think that this calls attention to the fact that this is decimal and these two are hexadecimal. Whereas if it's backslash D, it just looks completely different. Um, so I think that that regular expression is going to match this first example, 0x0.0p0. 0 0 0 0. So let's test that um, by saying else if uh, what is it? Hex float regex dot match string. Um, let's return zero. Oh no, that's actually the right value. Let's return um, one, two, three, four, five. Some kind of magical value that we will spot. Well, that didn't work. Can't parse float. 0x0.0p0. Zero 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 zero. What have I done wrong? Oh, I've forgotten to make this an extended regular expression is what I've done. So all of the white space in this was significant. But of course, I did not wish for it to be significant. Sorry, that's why I take things nice and slow. Okay, right. It has, that regular expression has matched it. Expected 0, got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um... So I think what I'm going to do is try and swallow this thing whole, um, by which I mean I'm going to try to actually do it, um, because I know that I can say pqe equals match dot values at. Is that a thing? I think it's a thing. Yeah, there we go. I mean, they are all zeros, but that has worked. Um, and once I've done that, I don't think there's really anything to stop me from just smashing these all together using maths. And then I'm going to have to... Yeah, the, the, the way this method is going to finish is by me doing this, right? Um... But in order to compute that value, I'm going to have to smash together P, Q, and E in the appropriate way. And what I want to do is do this in a way that at least that matches my understanding of what this notation means and hopefully works for the zero that we're trying to get to pass here. And then if I'm incredibly lucky, some or all of the other ones will also <laughs> work. But it's it's very rare that I'm that lucky. So I'm, I imagine this is going to be halting progress rather than just a complete success. But, but I can live with that. So what did I say this was? And what does this say it is? Well, okay. So it's mainly, mainly, mostly... So these are all, oh, I've just realized this isn't particularly useful because these are all strings. And unfortunately I can't just map over this because they're in different bases. So I think my attempt to use values out here is doomed. I think I'm gonna have to say match P, match Q, match E, so that I can say that's a base 16 number, that's a base 16 number, and unfortunately, this is a base 10 number. 
Oh, that's really pooed in my cornflakes. Oh well. This is what this is what it's like. This is why they pay me the big bucks to be doing this on YouTube. Zero. Zero pounds. Um, yeah, so sorry, what I was saying was it's mainly P times two to the power of E. That's mainly what it is. However, it isn't that, is it? Because it's got to be P plus Q. And Q at the moment, I mean, I've, it's a bit naughty that I've called this Q because Q is the interpretation of hex frac, which is not. Here, Q is like a whole number you know it's an integer but i don't actually want it to be an integer um i want it to be a fraction um whose size is well a fraction of the right size um how am i going to do this Um, I can think of two ways of doing it. Um, let's think about this using base 10. So if I've got, imagine I've got 1, 2, 3, dot 4, 5, 6, right? Or imagine I've got that in a string and I want to parse that into the, I mean, this is effectively what I'm, what I need to do now. Um, is put, and uh, you know I could I could stick an e7 on the end of that, but let's just ignore the exponent for now because that's kind of easy to deal with. Um, so let's say p and q. So this this thing here is my string. Let's say p and q are string dot split dot, and then I'm gonna map two integer over that and of course the default base is 10 so I get the right thing okay so I've split my string apart I've got my bit before the dot and I've got my bit after the dot oh I am gonna I am gonna do the seven because this relates to the point I want to make uh, okay so let's say p q e equals string dot split and q e equals q e dot split e so i've now got the i mean i could have just written this flipping array couldn't i i've got the bits of the number now um p q e equals p q e map to i So yeah, this is my. I'm, I, I'll I'll make a one liner that does the thing. So this is my parser essentially. I know I could I could it would have been quicker to use a regular expression for this now, but I'm committed. So we have a string. We have p, q, and e that are the bits of that, the components of that, the bit before the dot, the bit after the dot, and the exponent. Now this number is roughly one, two, three times, oh, sorry, P times 10 to the power of E. So it's about one, two, three with seven zeros after it. And indeed, if I say string to F, if I ask Ruby to interpret it as a float for me, that is actually pretty close, um, but it's not exactly right because I've missed off the four, five, six here. So the problem here is how do we incorporate that into the, into the answer? And I can see, as I said, two ways of doing that. 
One of them is to add in the right um, Q in the right way here to achieve what I want. And it's not just adding Q in, because if I do that, I've added one, two, three to four, five, six, and I get five, seven, nine with seven zeros after it, which is clearly not right. So what I actually need to do here is Q divided by a thousand uh, needs to be like that. Um, that's a bit grim. Could I do this with a rational number instead? Uh, that's a little bit of a distraction, but that's that's immediately made me think that like I don't like it that I'm doing a floating point division here, and in Ruby you can use rational numbers instead. If I divide Q by a thousand as a rational number, I get a, f you know, no precision has been lost here because it's not trying to represent it as a floating point number. Whereas here inherently, depending on the value of Q, the number you get may or may not be exactly representable as a float, um, which is something that I don't want to get into now, but I'm sure that given that we're implementing floats at some point, we're going to have to worry about rounding and inaccuracy and things like that. So this is something to think about later. But the point I wanted to make is that we can divide Q by a thousand. And so if we do that, then we're, we're taking one, two, three, and we're adding 0 0.456 to it. So we're sort of recreated the, we've recreated the bit, this bit. <laughs> so we've made a, we've made a floating point number now, you know, by dividing Q by a thousand, we made a, a little floating point number. And then by adding it back to P, we've reconstructed the bit before the exponent. And then now, of course, if we multiply that by 10 to the power of E, now we do get the same number. So that's that's way number one. And in fact, I can be a bit more specific than that and say, this isn't just an arbitrary, well, like, why is this, why have I divided by 1000 here? Um, the reason is that this is a three digit number after the decimal point. So... So really, the problem is I've already converted this to a, I was going to say I need to take the length of this string, but it's already, it's already not a string anymore. Um, technically, what I'm doing here then is 10 to the power of 3. Uh, God, it needs to be 10.0 to the power of 3. Um and three here is actually Q to, is how many digits there are in Q. The, the simplest way to get that is just to turn it back into a string and ask how many characters it is, because again, this has got an implicit base 10. So how many base 10 characters does it take to represent Q? Of course, I did used to have this as a string, so I could have asked that more directly. Um, so this is the sort of, I think, the fully general way of doing that, uh, by which I mean... If I made string, you know, four, five, well, let's say four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, E, three. Oh, I haven't done the, I've got to do my one liner. Now. Oh, yeah. I, I don't know why I did this. Four, I meant four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I wanted to show not only different digits, but the decimal point in a different place. Um, so there we go. Four, five, six, seven, eight, point nine. And if I ask Ruby to do that, four, five, six, seven, eight, point nine. So that's, that's the first way of doing it. Um, sort of, Div 
turning q into a little into a fraction which is incidentally what this is saying so this interpretation function for hex frac this is a recursive way of expressing the same idea this is essentially saying that as you stack up more and more hex digits you add on each successive digit as being a 16th of the size of the previous one and so as a result you get something a little bit like what's going on here um, and maybe it's easier to understand the f decimal fraction here that uses powers of 10 rather than powers of 16. So as I keep saying that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it though is to if I go back to my one two three four five six example uh, Where's the one liner there? One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, uh. um, another way of doing it is to, another way of thinking about this is that the result we were looking for was one, two, three dot four, five, six times 10 to the power of seven. But we did some massaging of this number to effectively we're dividing it by a power of 10 here so an, a, a different way of thinking about this is to say that we're multiplying it by a negative power of 10 so that's the dividing by 10 to the power of something is the same as multiplying by 10 to the power of minus that thing so there's something algebraic going on here where it's like we're in here there's a multiplication by a negative power of 10 and then in here there's a multiplication by well actually we don't this doesn't have to be a positive power of 10 but in our example it is so the sort of there's some antagonism between like well one thing's being made into a smaller number by multiplying it by a negative power of 10 and the other thing is in this case being made larger by being multiplied by a positive power of 10 and we can sort of pre-compute that and just consolidate it into a single multiplication by a power of 10 instead of doing it piecewise like this. And what I mean by that is, more straightforwardly, 123.456 times 10 to the power of 7. If we move the decimal point to the right three places, so if we say stick it there, and then stick it there, and then stick it there, so it's on the end. I don't think this is syntactically valid Ruby to have it on the end. But this is what I mean. It's like if the decimal point moves all the way to the end, so that instead of 123.456, we just write 123.456, then what we've done is made the number a thousand times larger than it should be. And we can compensate for that by adjusting the power of 10 that we're multiplying it for. So instead of multiplying by 10 to the power of 7, we can say, well, it's three powers of, we know we've made it three powers of 10 too big by doing this operation. So we'll compensate for that by saying 7, 6, 5, 4 here. And then, I mean, apart from the fact that the this is no longer a float, we've come up with the same answer. And to me, this is sort of more satisfying to consolidate the powers here rather than to have that. So what does that look like in this case? So this was what I had before. Um, what I'm talking about now is we're not adding P and Q. Effectively, what we're doing is concatenating their binary their decimal representations so i mean this is ugly um p to s plus q to s and then that whole thing to int so that's set this is the one two three four five six if you like and then we're multi multiplying it by 10 to the power of e minus so every digit of Q is making this concatenated number 10 times too large. So for every digit of Q, we need to reduce E by one so that we're knocking off a power of 10 to balance out the fact that we've made the, made the number a power of 10 too large. So this is E minus Q 
to s length again to get how many digits there were in that number um one two three four five six o o o which is apart from the fact that it's not a float the same as what we had before you know i can fix that by making any of these making that 10 into a float for example Um, so either of those will work for what it is that I'm going to try to do here and I, the reason I'm pausing is I'm just trying to think about like which one of those do I actually want to do I mean this is kind of grim because it's turning them into strings but they already is strings they already is So is there really any harm in concatenating those strings before we interpret them as a hex number and then just nudging the exponent? Oh, except the exponent is... Oh, no. Sorry, I was... Ah, uh, that's interesting. The reason I the reason my brain was ground to a halt there was because I was thinking about in this example I've just given, everything is in base ten. So P and Q are, are base ten numbers and the exponent, the number after E, is you know, what are we multiplying by ten to the power of? So everything is is base ten, the exponent is ten. Here it's a little bit more fiddly because the exponent is base 2. So... <laughs> so one hex character doesn't correspond to one change in the power of 2. It corresponds to 4? Let me just explain what the hell I'm talking about. If I write let's just write one two three in hex apparently that's 291 now if i add a character on then how much larger does this get and the answer is it gets 16 times larger because this is base 16 and 16 is 2 to the power of 4 2 4 8 16 right so if we wanted to do this my clever clogs way of modifying the exponent to compensate for what we've done with the concatenation of p and q we just need to be mindful of the fact that it's not we don't directly subtract the length of q we have to multiply it by four to turn it into an adjustment to the power of 16 that has happened by adjusting the length of the by adjusting the length of the number that's being multiplied by the exponent. Oh, it's all getting a little bit fiddly, isn't it? Maybe I shouldn't try to be clever. Maybe I should just use this. Use this. I just thought I was being clever thinking about consolidating those powers of 10, but there's such a thing as too clever, isn't there? Um... All right, I'm going to try the less clever one because, you know, I've got that I've got that slide that says I'm supposed to be prioritizing um uh you know, clarity over cleverness, right? Um up there. Um so maybe I should actually force myself to pay attention to that rather than... I'm sorry that I just spent 10 minutes on this digression that... I mean, it's not, it's not, it's not definitely wrong. Let's try the simpler one, which I think is more...
justifiable um, and see what happens. Yeah, let's go with that. And like, if there's a problem with it, then I can try switching to the other way and see. Like the reason why I wanted to do it this way in the first place is because it feels like there's less opportunity for loss of precision here. And maybe I'm, maybe what I just said is not true. Like it's a gut feeling rather than something that I know. So it's possible that I'm just not thinking about it in the right way. But it felt to me as though this, this way that's just a a single multiplication of some number by 10 to the power of whatever felt like less risky. I always get in this, this is the feeling I always get when I'm doing anything with floats is that like I'm frightened to touch the numbers in case they, in case I lose so much precision that the answer is not right. So this is a manifestation of a neurosis rather than something rational, I think. Um, okay, all right, let's see. Let's see how far I can get then. Um, so what I was saying was, this is not P times two to the power of E. It's P plus Q times Sixteen to the power of minus <laughs> oh. okay let's just think about because I need the strings I need the strings again so having said that it's pooped in my cornflakes I'm now fishing the poop out of my cornflakes and saying well maybe I do want this and then I just have to accept that these are going to be somewhere. These have to be converted. And then just remember that this is 10. I'm, I'm well aware that I'm, what I'm trying to do here is translate the number zero, um, which doesn't actually require any of these gymnastics. So maybe I should have, maybe I should have committed less. And I guess I still could. Um, but let's see how far can I get yeah I didn't really anticipate how fiddly this was going to be if I'm honest um, so this is the shape of it so p to integer q to integer times and then this is Again, rather than, I think rather than dividing it by that, I'm going to multiply it by sixteen to the power of negative q dot length. I think that's what I said. So we form this overall sum of it's essentially p plus q, but q has been scaled down to be a fraction rather than a whole number. Oh yeah, Chris is suggesting big decimal. Hmm. Let me finish this thought and, and see what happens with this, but that's a really interesting idea. Maybe I could use big decimal for this. Hmm. See what happens when I run this, and then I'll I'll definitely have a look at that. Hmm. Well, <laughs> something's worked because it's correctly produced the number zero. So you can see in these cases it's produced positive zero and negative zero. So what that tells me is whatever expression I've written here correctly evaluates to zero in the case where it's supposed to be zero. Um, when do I want to look at big decimal? Do I want to look at that now? <sighs> 
Yes. So So how much can I get out of Big Decimal, Chris? Like, what's this? I know this is going to give me arbitrary precision floating point numbers. Oh, is this is this you? Um, uh, trying to make me less worried about precision loss. That, like, if P and Q are in a Big Decimal, then I can multiply and divide them as much as I like and not worry so much about, you know, this says support for very large or very accurate floating point numbers. This is going to give me arbit an arbitrary level of accuracy so that I'm not going to lose anything by all these manipulations. Is that what you mean? Rather than worrying about the fact that I'm doing multiple weird things here. I realize these are all integers as well. Something in here needs to be a float. Um, I think probably this, because if I do 16 to the power of minus one. Oh, interesting. No, I don't need to, I don't need to do that because, yeah, okay, thanks, Chris. All right, well, let's see. Let's see how far we can get then. Like, I, I'm only hypothesizing that there's going to be accuracy issues here. Maybe this is all just going to work. Uh, I mean, I do kind of, I kind of like my concatenate the strings together technique. Let's get this working. Hmm. Yeah, it's a good point, Chris. Let's see how, let's see how far we can get down, given that I've Given that I've sunk all this cost, let's see how far we can get down this road and see if I do get any accuracy problems. Because at least right now, um, I, I'm going to say, what am I going to say? I'm going to say, begin supporting hexadecimal float notation. Uh, um, so far this only works for zeros, but it's a start. I don't know whether my method of uh, turning P, Q, and E into a float is sensible yet. Um, it may suffer from accuracy problems, in which case I may choose to either A, uh, use big decimal as suggested by setter, or B, um, concatenate the string representations of P and Q before converting them to an integer before converting it the result to an integer and adjust the exponent to compensate uh, for the moment I live in hope Okay, and I saw that the problem was just a parsing problem. So this is saying can't parse this float. 0x1921fb6p. I think it's just because of the plus. I think it's just the sign of the exponent here. Um, which I think I can just whack in there because... The exponent goes through to i, and that knows how to deal with a leading plus. 
So, oops. So I think I can just say a literal plus, which is optional. I think that's going to fix, well, it's going to fix the parsing of that example. Oh yeah, because this is raising an exception from inside an assertion. Because it's, it's not an assertion failure, it's uh, it's an exception. Um, can't see the name of the example that's failing here, but it's the one after F32 negative zero. F32 misc. Yeah, there it is. So this is going to be the real test of whether... Actually, what is this testing? F32 misc. Oh, sorry, this is the thing that returns it. So down here, there's going to be F a call to F32 misc. Yeah, okay, so it's looking specifically for this. This is just a miscellaneous float that's been picked, well, presumably arbitrarily. Um, so this is this is when we're going to find out whether all my munging is actually working because this is the first non-zero float we're trying to handle. But, well, let's see. Hey! Wow! So that one worked. That misc float, we did actually compute the right value here. Now, in hindsight, I perhaps shouldn't be surprised by that because it looked like this is actually a rational number in, in the case where this is a negative power of 16. Thank you, Chris. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe, yes, so, so maybe, Chris, I'm basically getting the same benefit. I didn't realize that this was going to give me a rational until I just, until I tried it out in IRB just now. Um, and that's quite cool, isn't it? Because I don't get any loss of precision. And I mean, you may be thinking where the hell, when does this get turned into a native float? And I think the answer is here. I think even though I'm sticking a rational into the array here, I think when you ask it to pack a float, um, I guess this gets coerced into a float. Um, so I think that sort of deals with my precision concerns. As long as the coercion to a float here does the right thing, which is, which I feel nervous about given that this is all about six, sorry, 32-bit floats and Ruby floats are not 32-bit, they're 64-bit. So at the moment, we're doing fine. Um, I assume that this is being coerced to a Ruby float. So this rational is getting converted to a Ruby float. And then when we try to pack it into a 32-bit, into a single precision flow, it's, there's something inside pack that does something to convert a 64-bit flow into a 32-bit flow. I, I imagine that operation is part of I, IEEE 754. Um, so maybe it all comes out in the wash and everything is fine. Um, but anyway, the point is this operation, I guess, doesn't lose any precision because I haven't provided none of the numbers I've provided here are floats. They're all integers. And the only operation that might make a non-integer value, or in fact, definitely will, is, oh, unless Q is not present, is this. And apparently raising an integer to the power of a negative number in Ruby gives you a rational, which... Did I know that? I don't know that I did. It makes sense, but I don't think I could have pulled that information out of my brain. If you'd asked me, uh, I would have had to try it. So anyway, that's a long-winded way of saying my luck is in. So what's this? Um, support. Uh, so I had, a, I had something like this earlier, didn't I? support explicitly positive exponent in hexadecimal float notation. Yep. 
and I'm not going to bother linking to why it's implicit. I think I've labored that point enough the last time I made a commit like this, so I'm just going to let it go this time. Okay, so now what? What fresh hell is this? Oh, this is a negative exponent. Okay, well, that's, he says, easy. Um, I just need this to be... Ooh, I think if I put these inside a doodah, I don't need to escape this plus anymore. I think I can just do plus minus. Um, because the semantics of meta characters is different inside square brackets. Um, of course, part of that difference is that hyphen, which is not a meta character outside of the range syntax, uh, the the can't remember what the square brackets thing is called. I want to call it a range, but um, I don't know. Inside the square brackets, a hyphen is semantically meaningful as demonstrated by zero to nine. But if you put it at the end, it's not because it's not sandwiched in between two other characters. So I think I can just say plus minus here, which is what I want to put. So... Let's see what happens. Is that the same error as before? Can't parse float ox1 p minus 149. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's two problems here, aren't there? One of them is that the exponent is negative. The other one, which is very generously being introduced at the same time by this example, is that there's no fractional part. So I need to... I can always commit these two things separately, but to make this example pass, I've got to not only support negative exponents, but also, this is going to be a little bit hairy for the code I've just written down there. Is it? If, I, if I've got an empty string... Oh, it won't be an empty string, it'll be nil. If it's not there, it'll be nil. Um, if it's an empty string, that will be zero. If it's nil, I think it's going to blow up. So I ha I'm going to have to do something to arrange to prevent this from blowing up. Because I can make this whole section optional. That's fine. So that's this is a non-capturing group. And then I've put a question mark after it to make it optional. That's totally fine, um, but I think the code I've written is going to blow up. Yeah. What? Wrong number of arguments, given one expected zero. Is that because if you call 2i on nil? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so you can't, yeah, okay, you can't provide a, you can't provide a base when you call 2i on nil. Um, so... So there are two ways of doing this. Either I could repeat the capture group and make it pos instead of having a question mark here, I could have two alternatives. One of which is to is to say you either match dot followed by one or more hex characters, or you match the empty string, and the empty string goes into a capture group, capture group called Q. Um, or the alternative is to massage it down here. I'm going to cheat and massage it down here because I can see an opportunity to just say, if I force all of these to be strings, which they all are, if they have matched successfully. So this does not change the semantics of it in the case where these have all, these have all actually appeared in the, in the match. But now if any of them don't appear, and it's really only Q that I'm picking on here, but why not? Again, prioritize regularity. So this is essentially saying I want all of these capture groups as strings, even if they didn't match, in which case I want the empty string. And the reason I want the empty string is that that has the behavior I want here, which is that calling 2i16 on the empty string will give me zero. So this will be p plus zero multiplied by um, 
well, I don't really care what happens here because this is going to be adding on zero to P. So I think that is a roundabout way of achieving what I want. Yes, it is. So let me add those in the order that I realized I needed them, which is to say this first. So this one was support negative exponent in hexadecimal float notation. And then the rest of it is support missing fractional part in hexadecimal float notation. And what am I going to say about it? Um, I've made this work by coercing all, uh, what does it call them? I mean, they're match groups, but like, what does it call the, I'll just say matching values into strings, which they should be anyway, but will have the effect of turning nil into the empty string, the empty string in the case where any of the match groups are optional, uh, which Q now is. This is a bit of a hack, but it works because empty string to, to I returns zero as desired. Um, fine. Okay, what went wrong? Can't parse float. Oh, right. So what is this? After max finite, I think I might have, I might have spotted this one before. It's the thing about the trailing dot. So we did min normal, max subnormal, max finite, trailing dot. Yeah, so this is just checking that we can support that syntactically. Um, that's easy enough. Uh, I think this is literally just a one character change because we're allowed to do... So if this optional group does match and we match the dot, it's okay for there to be zero of these. So this actually can be star. Now in this case, Q does match and it will just match the empty string. So we're not leaning on the coercion from nil here. We're just leaning on the semantics of two integer in Ruby for the empty string. Great, so trailing dot is working. Um, need some inspiration um, support um, uh, fractional part with no digits uh, in hexadecimal float notation uh, that is the radix point is there but there are no hexadecimal digits after it. Apparently, this is fine. Like Ruby doesn't let you do that. You can't do, you can't write one, two, three dot, or at least IRB doesn't let you do that. Um, let's say puts one, two, three dot. No, that's just a syntax error. But in WebAssembly text syntax, that is permissible. So I think that's, I think it looks like that completed the hex notation. I'm amazed that we got through that. The, the thing with the, um, that thing with the rational is very fortunate. <laughs> um, 
and actually in hindsight I'm relieved that I didn't need to do my weird I think the the thing that I thought was clever about avoiding the you know multiple exponents was largely motivated by the fact that it was 10 in both positions whereas here there's a 16 here and there's a 2 here so like I said we would have had to adjust it by multiplying it multiplying the power of 2 by 4 anyway so it was really the wisdom of that idea became significantly decreased as time went on and so the fact that this just works is very satisfying okay so now i mean i'm going to keep going with this because it feels like we're dangerously close to having at the very least all of the 32-bit floating point literals working and then it's unclear to me how much more work 64-bit might be but the answer could be very very little like it might be because all I need to know is I need to plug in different sizes for the exponent and I need to use different formats for pack and unpack but apart from that in theory all of these might just work so I'm going to try and get to the end of this if I can and see what happens now <clears throat> excuse me this is quite appealing because Ruby knows how to parse these like I can just plug this in and say what is that to float So the reason I'm hesitating is because earlier I talked about benefiting from regularity. And there's, in the opposite direction, there's something tempting about repeating this code for a decimal float. And you still get P, Q, and E. You know, it's all the same, and the only thing that's different is that you're multiplying by 10 to the power of the exponent, and then these are all 10s. All of these 16s and the 2 all become 10s. Otherwise, it's the same calculation. So... I mean, I'm afraid I think that there's like, I think that there's value in doing that. I think there's value in just repeating this because I've already figured it all out. Um, it's the same code. It's just different constants in this expression. And while I could just call 2f, I think it's better not to. Because otherwise, I'm, it becomes lopsided. It's like, oh, if it's a decimal flow, then we're just calling to F with whatever. I don't know what quirks that has. Um, whereas doing it this way, I completely control the syntax that we recognize. Oh, that's a good point. Is there anything here that we don't support syntactically? So, for example, the, yeah, right. Same, like, right. I think this is the justification that I want because Ruby can't parse this. Um, oops. Oh, crap, it can. What? <laughs> no, I really wanted that justification. Oh, hold on. That's not right. It... <laughs> Ruby, <laughs> go home, Ruby, you're drunk. This is such naughty behavior for a programming language, isn't it? Like, you can see why some people don't like... Like, this is this is almost a 23 dogs size of problem. Like, that it just silently says, yeah, exactly, Adam, right. It's like, 
oh, yeah, I completely know what that float that you've written is. That, that WebAssembly float, I know what that is. It's 1.0. It's like, it's not, is it, Ruby? It's not. So... Yes. So, I mean, I know that I could fix this. I could fix this by using a regular expression to smudge a zero in there so that it could be, like I just did here, so that it could be correctly transformed. But given that I was already leaning strongly towards reusing this code, I have now been tipped over the edge into, I'm definitely going to reuse this code because I've found the flimsiest possible justification, concrete justification, for doing the thing that ideologically I wanted to do anyway. And that's exactly the kind of thing that I'm looking for, is some kind of retconning of my own personal preference with something that could semi-convincingly be described as evidence. So let's do it. So what I'm talking about is I'm going to just copy the code I've already written, copy the regular expression I've already written, and just tweak it to work with decimals. So, um, and yeah, I mean, I'll, I, can, I can extract a helper to do this and then parameterize it on the stuff that I'm going to change here, but let's see it work first before I go before I start extracting a helper that isn't going to work for some reason I didn't know so I called this hex flow and I think I named that after this this one is it's a little bit rude it's a bit decimonormative that they've just called this float and this hex like call it Desk deck float. Um, <laughs> Chris, I really hope that WebAssembly doesn't have a date type. I do not want to deal with that. I'm sure it doesn't. I'm sure it doesn't. <laughs> um, he says, he says confidently. Um, anyway, sorry. I, I do talk a lot of rubbish, don't I? What I should just be saying, why don't I, this is why this stream is taking so long is because I can't just straightforwardly say the obvious thing, which is here it's called float. So I'm going to call it float to match the spec. I don't need to editorialize. I don't need to give my opinion on whether that's what it should be called or try to make a joke about it. I should just shut up and do it. 10. 10. 10. And then this is also 10. Is this right? P is in decimal, Q is in decimal. And that's why 10 appears here, because that is the base that Q is expressed in. And then separately, unrelatedly, this scientific notation also is 10 is the base of the exponent in scientific notation. So I've, I'm convinced myself that that is all correct. Um, 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 um. Oh, right. I was like, I'm done, right? I'm not done because I've got to write the regular expression, haven't I? That's okay. It's going to be sort of this one. Uh, so, um, stick it in here float regexp um this becomes merely naught to nine again i'm going to resist the temptation to make this backslash d because i think this is at a glance way easier to read and understand um zero to nine there zero to nine here oh and this p is not a p it's an e oh and of course there is no zero x at the beginning but otherwise, I think that this is correct. So let me put my money where my mouth is. If I haven't made an error here in the regular expression or in this code that I've copied and pasted, then 
Um, all of these tests are going to pass, including trailing dot. Um, what's this one going to do? I mean, I don't know what root beer float is. What is this? Not now, Twitter. A programmer walks into a bar and orders 1.0000119 root beers. That's a root beer float, or in that case, make it a double. Okay. Ah ha ha. All right, so that's a funny joke. Why is that? Are we linking to it here m merely to justify the name? Like, is this here as a joke, or does this... Like, is this just for funsies? I'm not against fun. If this is here for fun, I'm actually all in favor of that. It's just that I don't know if that's why it's here. Why don't we use the sophisticated technology of git blame to find out why the root beer float is here? Place your bets as to whether you think this is going to this commit history is going to be in any way enlightening. I suspect it will not be. Yeah, exactly. Let's find the comedian. Who is, who, who is being funny? Oh, good. We're going to have to look further back to find this out. Does Git have like a... Sorry, I know that Git does. Does GitHub have like a thing? Does it have a solution to this problem? Um, like, is that view blame prior to this change? Oh yeah, Adam, that would be a great reveal if it, if we find a commit that was by me introducing this. That would be amazing. I only have, I'll have you know, I only have one commit in the WebAssembly spec. Um, uh, how does this work? How do you find, some somewhere in this view, you can see all of the commits that someone's made, right? This is not an important, uh, so, Rosberg, not interested in you, mate. <laughs> Here we go, 23rd of August, when I was reading this specification, I noticed that invertible was spelled wrong before, uh, as part of invertible bijections. So, please note that I am one of the, one of the authors of or at the very least contributors to the WebAssembly specification. And anyone who says I'm not is lying. Um, right. Okay, let's view blame prior to this change. I mean, goodness knows what is going to happen when I press this. Well, it scrolled me to a totally different place, so that was unhelpful. Miscellaneous floating point and Unicode tests. So maybe this is the last, yeah, that's when it appeared, which strangely, there's no way of seeing that in the interface. Sunfish code. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It was a good joke. Um, beer. Anyway, I suppose this isn't important, but I'm just curious as to why this was added. Uh, oh, look, there's even an XKCD in here. Okay, well, this is not illuminating, so let's have a look at the commit message that introduced it. Um... Because that will, oh, it doesn't. So it says, add a test for a decimal floating point literal rounding. Wow, look, this syntax used to be different. We're 
really gazing into the past here. This is from 2018. Um, slashes are now underscores. Uh, timeline goes sideways. Um, so I assume this is testing something interesting. I assume, you know, I don't... Maybe I didn't fully understand the joke, you know? I, I, I got it on a surface level, um, but I didn't get it on, a, on the deep level that someone who actually knows something about IEEE 754, for example, the fact that it is 754, um, could. So, um, getting back to business, what I was anticipating was that well, if we're lucky, if this root beer float thing isn't actually a problem, I think we might hit the F64 NAN. I think it's possible that all of these will work and we'll hit the F64 NAN. That might... It's not... There's no law of physics that says that that can't happen here. So let's see if it does. What? <laughs> Why can't that? Oh, there's no. Gosh darn it. My hubris. Um, there's no exponent on this, which oddly is not something that we had to support up here, but I remember from the syntax that it is something that we sh that we need to support. <laughs> it should be fine to omit the to omit the exponent here. Poop. Well, I got all excited about that, didn't I? Anyway, hopefully this is easy to fix. I just have to make this whole exponent shenanigan. optional like that and now I'm glad that I did this blanket splatting of the map to string because that's going to mean that if the exponent isn't there let's just think about it if the exponent isn't there then it's going to be the it's going to be the match is going to be nil so that's going to turn into the empty string and that's going to be converted to zero and that's going to mean that we're multiplying the number by 10 to the power of 0, which is 1, which is the multiplicative identity on the numbers that we're talking about. So, it's fine, is what I'm saying. So now it's going to work. Now it's going to work. Now it's going to work. Yes. <laughs> it did work. It did work. We got all the way through to the root beer flow and now it's just f64.const that isn't working. So that is great. Um, I am, again, for the sake of regularity, I'm gonna make the p optional even though we don't have any tests that yet that try to use that. Um, Uh, it gets going to get very confused about this. Let me just temporarily remove this so that the git so that the diff doesn't become horrendous, um, because I want to do that first. So this is support missing exponent in hexadecimal float notation. And I'm not going to say any more than that. Oh, no, I am. Um, I haven't hit any tests for this yet, but it's allowed by the grammar. And we need... And there are tests for the comparable case. Uh, uh, Oh, 
of there are decimal float tests for the comparable case so for the sake of regularity not to mention correctness I'll add the support now really what I mean by that is that if I'm ostensibly if this is ostensibly a copy of that regular expression that's been tweaked a little bit I want to I want this thing to be in the regular expression that I'm ostensibly copying so there we go um So I want, what do I want to say? Basically, support decimal float notation. Um, this is essentially a copy of the hexadecimal float support with tweaks to the allowable characters and the various bases used. Um, for the uh, digits and exponent. Magnitudes is the word that the spec uses. Okay, great. So now I don't wanna stop yet because I think I've done all of the difficult part. Um, now there's just a mechanical part which is making it work for f making it work for 64 bit floats so what's the first problem the first problem is it doesn't even recognize the instruction so where i've got f32 here i need to say f64.const um job done uh unhandled exception which is that time bomb I put in earlier um, at the start of interpret float to say whoa 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 I only know about 32-bit numbers so um, I'm going to say I'm going to put a message in here you know unsupported float width Bits. So just to check that that's where that error is coming from. Yes. Um, so let's say make uh, interpret float error. <laughs> um, more. make it more something uh let's just say add explanation <laughs> to interpret flow error because that's all i'm doing that's one of those classic commit messages that's really just restating what you can already see the changes but um let's say i'm about to add support for 64-bit floats which will cause an exception here so now is a good time to care about the error message being meaningful. Okay, I mean, I've, I'm slightly uh, rewriting history there because of course I'm, I've already started doing that, but just keep it between me and you. No one will ever know that I lied in that commit message. Um, unsupported float width, all right. Um, Well, in that case, let's support it, shall we? So let's now, let's say, unless 3264 include bits. Because those... 46. Because um, now we're trying to support 64-bit floats. Ooh, reinterpret. Right. Similar situation here. Um, uh, 
Um, I'm just trying to think about what I mean by this exception here. I think what I really mean is like now that I've got two different options here, I don't want to check this is equal to 32. I want to check that it's equal to, that it matches, you know, that I'm reinterpreting a 64-bit flow as a 64-bit integer and mutatis mutandis for 32-bit. So I think what I want is something like float bits equals, is it operation slice? and then raise unless bits equals float bits. I think that's what I actually mean. The 32 was just me being lazy and not not yanking it out of the operation. Is that is operation what it's called? Yes. So, right. This is what I was looking for, is that now we've, now the assertion has failed. This is where I wanted to get to was a point where we are getting a NAN back, but right now it's a 32-bit NAN, not a 64-bit one because we haven't actually done any work to make it 64-bit. So I know I'm jumping around here, but I'm just trying to get to the finish line and then I'll think about how I stage this as a series of commits. Um... So what needs to vary? This needs to vary. This, this, or this. basically anywhere we're doing pack and unpack. It's the short version of that. Um, everything else is parameterized on bits or it includes magic numbers like 16 and 10 that's sort of hard-coded according to the the actual format we're parsing. There's nothing else here. As long as mass bits is the correct value, I think we're fine there. Okay, so... Uh, sorry, I'm, I've gone silent because I'm just thinking about what the best way to do this is. I guess I guess I can... So what I need is the number of mask bits. I need the pack format and the unpack format. Um, so let's say pack format, unpack format, and mask bits equals case bits in 32 in... 64. So if it's, I'm just going to return a raise here. I'm just using, I know it. that's why I paused because I was like, shall I make a hash? I probably should make a hash and I can assign it to a constant and it can live outside of this method, but I'm just trying to, I've got, I've got the blinkers on tunnel vision. It's nearly midnight. I just want to get, I just want to see this work and then I'll make a separate decision about whether I've got enough energy to tidy it up and refactor it and I'm conscious that I should probably extract this as a helper as well um, rather than just copying and pasting it because I said I would consider that once I've seen it work and then as soon as I saw it work and I got my dopamine hit I was on to the next thing so I'm trying to retroactively come up with some responsibility here okay so this is pack format is f unpack format is l and mask bits is nine. Let's, for now, let's make that the same and just find all of these places where I need to. So everywhere that I see F, that I believe is the pack format. And everywhere that I see L, I believe that is the unpack format. So I don't, I no longer need you to fix me. Um, same. And 
this line can just be deleted. And oops, my vim foo is really not very good. That's okay. I've only been I've only been using it for twenty five years. I need to I need to put some time in. Um, right. So this is intentionally sort of a no op, uh, just to see it fail in the same way. So I'm still expecting all of the other ones to keep passing and I'm and it's going to complain about f64.nan. Yes. Okay, so now <laughs> I kept this tab open way longer than I would normally keep a browser tab open because I was anticipating the need to do this. So instead of F, we shall instead use D for double not bad and i remember that instead of l we're going to use q because i made a joke about that being quite long yeah there we go 64 bit and i know because i've wasted the gift of life that i, I typed in 11 there because it's an 11 bit exponent but of course we add on one for the sign bit, which is making me think that this shouldn't, that we should actually compute mask bits from how many exponent bits there are, because otherwise these numbers are extremely mysterious. And if they were 8 and 11, at least that matches up with, th those are more obviously recognizable as the size of the exponent. So let me just. Ah, screw it, I'm going to do it. Uh, exponent, I don't know why I thought it might be able to autocomplete that because I'd already said it. So this is the exponent bits plus one sign bit. So that, you know, the fact that I tried to type 11 there is forcing me to type 11 there. Um, so this is, I know this is a little bit silly because we don't actually need we never use the raw exponent bits, but I would rather, for the sake of adding one to it here, I would rather, these are straightforward properties of the the two precisions we're working with. And this is sort of a derived property for the very specific purpose that we're using here. In fact, if we, if we were using mask bits in only one place, I would just inline this expression, but I think this expression would get harder to read if we didn't have this local here. So I'm going to, that gets to live. Um, I'm just checking the diff to make sure that that all makes sense. I'm sort of delaying the moment where I run this because I'm, I feel like I deserve the happiness of all of these tests passing when I run them. I don't know why I, I don't know why I say things like that because that is just tempting fate, isn't it? Um, well, let's just accept that something is going to go wrong here. Um, I'm not particularly worried about this, parsing a float from binary. I definitely don't know how to do that. Yeah, this is just going to fail, isn't it? So um, let's cushion ourselves for this inevitable blow. This here is taking advantage of the script uh, this like script syntax that's defined by the reference interpreter, uh, the test script. Um, one of the cases in this grammar I remember is module in binary format. We haven't seen this before. We've seen this module quote thing in some of the other tests where there's just a, an inline string containing a module and then the assertion will say that a cert malformed or whatever that's sort of checking that that um that that module is malformed this is a new thing we're seeing where this is a sequence of bytes that presumably represents the like i said there are two different representations of WebAssembly programs one of them is textual human readable s expression style and the other one is just a sequence of bytes in a file 
um, of course, the next expression is just a sequence of bytes in a file, but I mean, you know, more compact than that, not human readable, you know, one or two bytes per instruction, whatever the deal is. Um, I haven't even looked at that yet. I've never clicked on binary in the sidebar of this spec, so I, I, I don't actually know what the binary format looks like, but that's clearly what this is. Um, and the comment here suggests that this is the binary representation of defining a function called 4294967249, um, which then gets invoked from here. Now, because I don't know what to do, in fact, yeah, I don't know what to do with this. I'm actually a little bit surprised that it's, oh no, I'm not surprised that it's parsed it because the parser doesn't know anything about the syntax of this. It's just treating these as undifferentiated atoms. Because I don't know how to interpret this binary format, when I go to, this is going to have no effect when I evaluate it. In fact, is this going to cause a, this is going to cause a pattern match failure when the interpreter reaches this, I think, because, or is it going to, yeah, I think, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know exactly what's going to happen, but I imagine it's going to cause a pattern match failure. Um, and then this is going to, this is going to deal with, the, the, you know, once we've, if this doesn't cause a pattern match failure, which I'm guessing it will, this is going to say there is no function called 4294, blah, blah. So there, this is definitely going to cause a problem. I'm ignoring all the assert malforms though. So I think there's only going to be one, I'm hoping there's only going to be one failure. Sorry, that was a very long run up to me actually running the test. Let's see what happens. Hubris. Damn. I've run them. I just ran them, Chris. Uh, make a float class to hide away some of the complexity so that you can do float sine equals one or float exponent equals payload. That's a really good idea. Um, I will certainly, I'll add that to my list. Uh, so something like, oh look, I've already done this one. Um, extract float class per zeta. I think that's a good idea. Um, well, I'm sorry, Chris, you can't go to bed yet because this test is not passing yet. F64 min positive. It worked fine here. I mean, this this really gives me the willies because this is extremely likely to be precision problems, isn't it? F64 min positive. So this is trying to represent the smallest possible float so it's saying expected one got zero and bearing in mind that these are the decimal representations of those floats it means uh, the bit patterns it means it was expecting i'm not going to type 63 zeros it was expecting 63 zeros with a one on the end, and what it got was 63 zeros with a zero on the end. So our old enemy rounding has betrayed us here, I think, or at the very least precision, because this has failed at some point in that and, and, you know, this is a case where I can't simply say, oh, just use 2F in this case then. Um, I can't use 2F because this is a hex format, literal. Um, so, well, spoilers, I'm not going to try and fix this now. I'm too tired. It's nearly midnight. So I'm going to wrap this up in a minute. Um, so that where we're going to pick up next time is investigating... <laughs> why this isn't working and where the loss of accuracy is and what, if anything, I can do about it. It might mean using big decimal. So that might be the answer because this is going to be an extremely small number. Um, and in fact, 
that probably is the solution actually so thank you for suggesting that chris i think i think the problem here is that the exponent is so small that there's a risk that we're going to lose that we just can't do this multiplication inside 64-bit floats so I think we're going to need to, in the same way as previously, I did that thing of like stepping into the world of sign numbers, doing a computation and then stepping out of it again. I think this is going to mean taking a step into the world of arbitrary precision floating point numbers, doing the multiplication needed to interpret the float, and then step back into the world of, world of fixed width 64-bit floating point numbers. It's a shame because min positive worked fine in the 32-bit case but of course if my explanation here is correct that's exactly what we would expect because anything you do here is going to fit extremely comfortably inside a 64-bit float without loss of precision because all of these are things that can fit inside a 32-bit float so it's perhaps consistent with my guess about what's going on here that this is pushing right up against the limit of what you can do in a 64-bit float and as a result you can't do this multiplication with 64-bit floats. You need a little bit more wiggle room than that, and so yeah, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to use big decimal basically, I think. Um, but that feels like a rabbit hole I don't want to go down in the next three minutes before the stroke of midnight and I turn into a pumpkin. So let's I'll finish by making a commit here. Um, let's say. See, I feel pretty comfortable with just um, adding 64-bit. Yeah, yeah. Okay, Chris. Yeah, I I also don't know for sure whether Big Decimal is going to help. Um, the problem is that WebAssembly's specification is... It is doing what we're doing. It's just, it specifies it in the abstract land of mathematics where it doesn't, where they don't need to think about precision issues. So making a concrete implementation of that, I guess big decimal is the way that we do that. It's like big decimal does let you create arbitrary precision numbers uh, in a way that guarantees you're not going to lose any of that precision. But then I am worried that it's actually rounding behavior that's biting us here. And I again, I don't think Ruby gives us any control over that. So yeah, it could potentially be the entire next stream that I do, banging my head against this wall and trying to figure out how can I achieve the correct, uh, the correct behavior here. Um, what I was going to say was that I think it's okay. Well, here's what I'm going to do. I am going to, so this is sort of, this change I introduced here is sort of parameterizing interpret flow on all of those like precision specific facts. Uh, parameterize interpret flow uh, implementation. Uh, on precision specific information uh, these values are all specific to 32-bit floats so rather than hard code them everywhere I'm just storing them in one place and picking them based on the single supported um, uh, bit width and that makes me realize that actually <sighs> 
actually, I've decided I want to put this up here because then this can just become an else. I think that's much more natural than repeating that information. So this is sort of, <laughs> we already had a check to make sure that bits was 32. And now this is doing that same check, but it's also getting, a, it's getting a side benefit of that check, which is when the check succeeds, it actually assigns some useful values. What did I just do? Oh, I hate it when I do that. Oh no, that's correct. Okay, I didn't do anything. I don't hate it when I do anything because I didn't do anything. Um, right, so that all still works fine. So can I just amend that? Does that still make sense? Yeah, that's fine. That's I think that stands on its own. Um, now this is gonna, there's gonna be a merge conflict here, uh, git restore, there's, um, cause the quick, this is the quickest way to resolve it. It's just to recreate the change I just did there, uh, rather than fiddle about with conflict markers and stuff. Um, fine. So that's great. That's a very small change. Um, so there and there. Um, so this is simply implement the f64.const instruction. So I mean, obviously it's the act, the material changes inside interpret flow, but you can look at the diff if you want to understand that. Um, and now this, arguably there are, goodness sake, why am I so? Arguably there are two changes here. There are two changes here. So, What I'm doing here is doing the thing that I said I was too lazy to do before, um, which is um, dynamically uh, check float width in reinterpret F32 implementation. Um, now that this isn't hard coded, it's easier to add support for other widths, other. It's actually, um, determine. So that's just justifying this no op that's like, well, now we'll pull that number out of the operation. And now I can add in the thing that says implement the reinterpret F64 instruction, which of course doesn't do anything. So we've come a long way. It's now past midnight. Um, a lot of these tests are now passing, but not all of them. I, sadly, I cannot end this stream by adding uh, floatliterals.wast to the list of tests that we run because it's still not passing, but that's okay. I feel like that was actually, if you ignore how long it took, I think that was actually pretty good progress because um, we've got, you know, a semi-convincing implementation of 32-bit float literals and then the 64-bit one is pretty close to working. Um, you know, the miscellaneous 64-bit flow, actually, I don't know why I'm pointing with my finger, I've got a mouse. Um, 
you know, this arbitrary one does actually work, which means that in the general case, our encoding is working. It's just that unfortunately in the specific case of the smallest possible number, it's not working. So there you go. That's how it goes. Um, it's time for the weekend. Um, I'm probably not going to stream next week or at least not, uh, not straight away. Uh, so I might take next week off, but I'm definitely going to come back to this. I know this is a bit of a cliffhanger, but I'm going to come back to it and get it working. And then we can move on to implementing, you know, once we get into F32.wast, we'll be implementing operations on these floats, which will be a whole other can of worms, but, um, that's something to look forward to. So, um, for now I will say goodbye. Uh, if anyone is still here, thank you very much for staying up late and watching this. Um, I hope there was something interesting in here, but regardless, I'm very grateful that you're here and just giving me moral support. So thanks for coming. I'll definitely see you next time. Bye.